Right, girls and boys, the gentleman that's about to come onto the stage and do this first line on talks is an old pal of mine. We've known each other about, gosh, about 15, 16 years now. We met back in a variety of drunken parties when I used to work at the comedy store and would go to the opening of a fridge if I was invited doing jazz hands, to be quite frank. And at the time, John was out and about doing it all as well. Jazz hands, just like that. So uh, we met up and his lovely wife, and I've seen his children grow up. And he's done lots and lots of charity events. Whenever I used to ring John up, he always knew I was asking him to do some kind of charity event for me, and he never said no. Uh, and he does a huge amount of stuff for charity, as well as for himself to make money, because he likes to be, you know, a well-off man that lives in Didsbury. Uh, you've seen him on Cold Feet. You've seen him on Fat Bob, your Fat Blobby Bastard on Paul Carr, which is my particularly favourite. Uh, you've seen him on The Fast Show. Uh, and we're going to be talking about everything tonight, how we started. We're going to talk about how John had struggles with uh, alcoholism and addiction and how he came through it. And, you know, he's got some great stories and advice for everyone who might have done. But without further ado, and without waffling, I'm going to go back to the stage and I expect a massive thunder practice clapping, please. A round of applause, clap. Right, that's good. You've got that now. Practice snapping your feet. Now, the are going to rubbish. Practice snapping your feet. That was. When Joe comes to stage, I want to give a massive rapturous round of applause for the first of our Landlord Talks evenings with the wonderful Mr. John Thompson! Come here, you brother! Parkinson never kissed his desk, by the way. Nice, isn't it? Welcome to my front room. Thank you. Thank you. It's lovely to be here at the Two Tubs. Wait. Is the Two Tubs, um... Barrels, yes. that's what it is. Out on front. How old is this pub, John? This pub, I believe, is 500 years old. Is there a spook in that place? I keep getting told the spooks in here, mate. I like I a ghost story. Man. Do you see, like there's a little girl, well, Julie will tell you, Julie comes in every morning. The most recent ghost, when I took this place over, the chap called Ellis, God bless him, who was running it, and they looked after it for the lady that had been kind of running, well, falling over a lot previously <laughs> for two years. And uh, basically, Ellis passed away very sadly the third day after I took this pub on. But the way that the, there's a few people here who are a big part of this pub, and one of the reasons I stayed is because I watched how they looked after his affairs and everything that happened after he passed away. And I realised what a special pub this was, and it was one of the reasons I actually decided to stay and, and run the place. So, can I have a little round of applause for my staff and team? Proper, proper northern folk. So, it's been here 500 years, okay. the ghosts, according to Julie, there's a ghost of a little girl, there's a ghost of a cavalier, which I quite like, because I like a bit of cavalier, um, and we're going to be doing a haunted night if you want to call it. Oh, right, okay. It's well, a gay ghost. Is it? Puts the willies up here. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know it. <laughs> you know him? I don't want to know that joke. Well, you could come in next to I'm going to either just go, I, I have to, there's two things when you hear a joke you've heard before. You just go, I've heard. Yeah. Just then cut it down. Or you can go. <laughs> uh, and I think it's kinder to the first. It is. It is, isn't it? Very kind of you. That's all right. That's okay. It's my first night. Are you, are you, are you on my table? Yes. The drink of champions. The drink of champions. Yeah, lime and soda. It's very refreshing, but it does not make you wait. It does. <laughs> but if you were sailing and you had rickets, you sorted. Yes. You wouldn't get scurvy, would you? Is that what it is? Scurvy? Yeah, yeah scurvy. Yeah, yeah. No vitamin C, that's why the sailors got it. Because they were eating ship's biscuits and they didn't have any vitamin C. And then they realised that if they sucked on the limes and the lemons that they got off offshore, it, it cured the scurvy, and it was a, that's, that's what it was. And isn't that why Americans call us limeys? I think it might well be, John. Yes, I do like a bit of a story. <laughs> like that. I think it's true, you know. And also, so, there was a story going around my halls of residence when I was a student in... <laughs> at, uh, what was that? the Polytechnic. Uh, that shows how old I am. Because it's Manchester Metropolitan University. That a student at Liverpool University survived alone on pot noodles and was the first case of scurvy <laughs> since 1753. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, but that could quite possibly. I don't think there's, I, I mean, dehydrated vegetables, I don't think I've any bit of a seen it, so I'd love to believe that story. The pot noodles one. The pot noodles I'm What's your, fa uh, your favourite? King pot, I like a curry, uh, curry one. I like a, a you know a lot of products in the shops, uh, claim to be hot 
and the, that's for the mere mortals who don't really know what spice is. So, for example, the Monster Munch flaming hot aren't, are they? They're not. Even somebody who doesn't like, there's no heat in those, is there? Uh, however, the one exception to the rule of things that claim to be hot, that are seriously hot, are Bombay bad boys. Are they? No. Have you ever had one? No. That's a hot pot noodle. Is it? That's the black one with the red writing. See, um, I like the original spicy curry flavour. Uh, that's mine. I, 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 I do like a king pot, the larger size. I must have known. Um, I have been known to uh, make a butty in the past. Yes. Uh, oh, my bread. White has to be for the filth. For the pure filth of it. However, my mate said, uh, he said he, he enjoys a pot noodle deluxe, which is um, where a pot noodle is actually decanted into a bowl. <laughs> yes, posh. Decanted into a bowl and wait for it. So what, fat, fat. what makes it deluxe? He went, monster munch sprinkled on its top. <laughs> Chef! I'd have that. I'd pay five pounds for that. I'd pay five pounds for that. And the, and the doctor's bill for the scurvy. <laughs> <laughs> you just have a wedge of lime, that's all that. Right. On the side. On the side, like yeah. a tequila shot. Tell you what. Right then. <laughs> what a great start. I'm really enjoying myself already. Fabulous. Oh, it's, like, it's like Loaded magazine when it was good back in the day. Do <laughs> you remember that, wouldn't you? Uh, I saw, I saw I you know, be. Lorex underpants and a double base spread. Uh, I know I did a fashion shoot for Loaded, actually. <laughs> and it's a, yeah, yeah, proper one. I did a bit, wearing a few threads. And I did a, I did a proper fashion shoot for Arena Home Plus as well. Arena Home? Yeah, it was Elaine Constantine took those photographs. He directed Northern Soul, yeah. which is a film I did. And she's film. a brilliant, brilliant photographer. And a great director to be as well. Is that Paddy Constantine one? Uh, no, not related. Oh, me? Constantine. The Constantine did Yeah, name. two different people. Okay, I'll show yeah, up. Yeah, okay. Don't be smart. <laughs> That's all right. Right, shall we get the questions? Yeah. I've got some I've written them. I spent about 20 minutes writing these yeah. looking like. Look at you, like, at the back, sitting on the big seats. I hope you can take your shoes off. Can you hear us okay? Is it alright? The sound alright? Yeah, yeah? Okay. I'm really happy. Because I'm a trained actor and I can project, you see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, and I can't answer what. Mom would take tours of little plays on the road and then yeah. here. Do you see what I mean? So we'll just we'll go with it. I used to sell toilet paper at Rex and Margaret and we were and dad, but they're not quite the same projection. <coughs> That's it. Yeah, over there. Well I was uh What was the shittest job you ever did before you got into uh, oh, sorry, yeah, don't tell yeah, 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 yeah. Tell us. The worst job I ever did was when I was 18, I left, uh, I was just that, it was that kind of uh, limbo between um, sixth form college. I got me in was I did all right actually. I did really well at sixth form because it was, it was in Leyland, it was at Runshaw College. And uh, that's where I met Steve Pemberton from the League of Gentlemen. And I wrote my first comedy with Steve. He was a year above me and I, I, I had an affinity with Steve because he made me laugh out loud. And we wrote together, we used to write little end of, end of term reviews and sketches. So I met Steve at Runshaw. Uh, another person who went to Runshaw College in Leyland was uh, Lloyd Cole. You know Lloyd Cole in the commercial chair, Lloyd Cole. So it's a great, it was a great six form, but what it was, I went to a Catholic school and it was seriously strict. And you would, uh, there were tannoys in every room. So when it was a hot day, you were allowed to, there was a thing called hot day procedure, where you were allowed to undo your top button, one button, you were told you could do this. If you didn't undo your top button, you got a detention at my school, right? So top buttons were permanently done up, but you could sort of cheat it where you tie it tie a certain way and it push it up and it looked like it was fastened. If you had a fat neck like me. <laughs> and, uh... Yeah, it was very, very strict, and uh, corporal punishment was still going when I was there. But to be honest, the way kids behave these days, I'm, I'm getting a bit like... Oh, here we go. A bit like... Don't get Brexit on Windsor, what's doing on? What, you, you know I'm pro-Trump and pro-Brexit, don't you? Oh, that was that. No, I was joking, I'm a fool. I'm a fool. I just thought it just to, just to worry you. Anyway, um... Uh, shittest job. Shittest job was working in a chicken uh, factory. Oh, now. When you see those hens in lorries, you don't really see them anymore. There's like cages on sides of lorries and you see feathers sticking up, but you don't really see any hens. Now the idea of this, well I grew up in an agriculture, I, did, I was born in Salford, I was adopted in Didsbury, and my adoptive family brought me up just outside Preston, uh, in a little village called New Longton, which is on the way to Southport on the A59. 
and it's very, very leafy and green and lovely, and it's, but it's a lot of agriculture there, and there's a lot of chicken farms there. So when, the, the way things are now, I mean, what they used to do was circulate battery, I think batteries, the, uh, it's still going, isn't it? Is it still going, battery farming? I think they're trying to get rid of it, aren't they? The hens inside those cages, there's 24 hens in those, and they're tiny, it's horrific. And what they would do is they would circulate the hens from battery, as if like this was a nice thing, to free range. Now, free range is awful as well, really, because they're giant sheds, and they're just climbing on top of each other with those feeding troughs, low, like lights that hang about that high off the ground. And they just, just that's supposed to be free range, not free roaming, which is like happy hens, you know what? <coughs> anyway, so it was circulating the hens, so I had to get six hens, <laughs> so I had, had to carry 12 hens. And they used to have the beaks cut so they didn't peck each other's eyes out. And an inoculation for some sort of hen disease. Anyway, I turned up and they went, right, here's what you do. Come here, like big farmhand. And I'm like terrified of a massive bloke. And he went, you get a hen, one foot like that. And then another foot. So you get one foot. <laughs> it was six hens in each hand by, carried by one foot. And a fistful of hens. A fistful of hens, yeah. <laughs> so it's six hens, so... I was ripped at the end of it, I tell you. Uh, but covered, covered in blood and scratches when I got home. And my mum went, you are not going back there tomorrow. She would look at you and it was literally poor blood covered. And she went, I don't want you to go back. I was really upset. And I went, mum, I've no money. She went, I want you to do something else. I went, I'll give you another day. She went, ask for some gloves. She went, ask for some gloves that come up to your elbow crease here. Like a gauntlet or a marigold. And I went, well, I don't know about marigolds, Mum, but I'll give you... <laughs> and it all went in. But you imagine what farm was like. You were like, oh, glove, fuck it off. <laughs> so I bled for another day and left. So that's the worst. Oh. That, and the dust. There was no masks, like now. I mean, health and safety. In a way, it's so over, so over the top health and safety that it's, it's detrimental. But at the same time, it wouldn't... It, you know, I think a lot of people who probably worked in those jobs now are quite poorly, like lungs and things. Because no, no, not even the basic, you know when you're doing a bit of DIY, one of them masks sanding, they weren't, weren't even, even given them. And the dust in the place, it was like, oh. So that, that was great. Working in Pontins in Ainsdale, behind the bar, that was horrific. <laughs> Uh, my shift was. Why? Was it? Why? I wanted to be a blue coat. There weren't any. I wanted to be an entertainer. Oh, I wanted to be an entertainer. There weren't. Any, there's no spaces for blue coats. Oh. So they said to try the bar, and I went. Whatever. And they went. Oh, it was awful. It was horrific. It was pre-computerized till my maths then was amazing. I could like, oh, you know, like, I could add up in my head like a 15 drink round easily. But it was very expensive. It's 19. In 1988, a pint of Guinness was £1.32, and people used to go, what? You fucking what? And I'm like, well, I don't put the prices out. You know. I was nearly a fight every night, I nearly got in a fight, because I said I was tricking them with the, the rounds and everything. But my, my shift was horrific. It was, um, it was 7 till 4 in the morning, and then in the morning it was 10 till 12 bottling up. Nice. Horrible. And I shared a, a chalet with a lovely family at Woodhouse. House. Happy names. I remember turning the bathroom light on and they'd all go, <clears throat> and scurry under the bath. Oh, it was just minging. Someone went, those chalets that they give the staff, they, went, they put the donkeys in there in the winter. <laughs> and I'm like, are you serious, mate? No, I laughed. And they went, no, we didn't. <laughs> so that I didn't, no. I, I left there with a stammer. <laughs> yeah, I actually got a, 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 and it comes back sometimes. Not been a, was there any particular reason he got a stammer? Was it just, I, think it was the, I think it was the trauma of. Uh, <laughs> what did he say? You know, as films now it goes, this film contains mild peril. Yeah. Well, that my job contained more than my. my it contained peril. <laughs> or peril. Well, it just they were for hard people. They were right, as cheap as chips to go to Pontin. Someone told me. In 1989, it was £11 a week to stay there, self-catered. At uh, Easter's Hunters. You can move in. Well, you might have, you might have, homeless might as well go, you know what I mean? For a weekend. You know what I mean? But it was grim. And the barbed wire is to keep, you know, to stop them getting, to stop them getting out. <laughs> I lived in Prestatin, was born in Prestatin, Pontin, as you to see him shipped in and shipped out again, mate. Oh, uh, Pontin, honestly, and they do this thing called the crocodile, 
crocodile, crocodile, we're walking in single file. It's basically taking the kids off to the chalet so the parents get leaded and, uh, and just leaving them to their own devices. They'd have wrestling on there on a Sunday, British wrestling. Oh. You know, blokes and leotards and women screaming, chucking handbags at them. I mean, uh, it was, it was an eye-opener. If you were a wrestler... Well, we go for a drink afterwards at a place called Toad Hall on, in Ainsdale. The, 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 Ainsdale's supposed to be the posh part of, of Southport, really, but... Southport. It's, uh, yeah, it's not... I don't think it, it's still open, but they use it for like uh, weekenders now. You know, need to be, uh, uh, you know. I've been to a few. Have you? So going back wrestling. Yeah. Have you ever thought about doing a bit of wrestling? Well, <laughs> uh, you, to you look at me, got a wrestler build. I am built like a brick shit house, and um, <laughs> I. The thing is, though, I had a very lovely upbringing. I don't have a tragic childhood story for you. I mean, no, well, tragic, uh, well no, but I didn't have to the bite me way for a football on the estate. <laughs> I didn't. So I'm not. I, I'm not Andy. I'm not tasty. I don't, you know, I have no fighting skills because I wouldn't want them. I was probably, I used to sit under a tree reading a book. You know what I mean? Huh? I, I, I don't, I, I'm as strong as an ox with the mind of a child. I, I, I concur. So, you're very strong, Same but thing. I don't have any kind of, I don't like confrontation, I don't like violence. I like fake violence, I like horror films, I love all that. I mean, my, that's waned since I've had children a bit, but I've always, always liked kind of, those really, I've always loved horror films and, and, and those kind of. You love tech and you love. You, friends of mine who went round your house on well, birthday party, yeah, Johnny, said you love tech. And I love do love tech. Of, what's your favourite gadget? What's my favourite gadget at the moment is I've wired my Alexa to operate my lights in my bedroom. Oh, fantastic. Eh? So, and my music. It's the so, uh, I've got a Bose speaker connected to my Alexa. And my lights, I've got hue lights in the two bedside lights and a standing light in the corner. So I'll walk in and I'll go, Alexa, lights relax. And it goes, <laughs> like that. And I've got Alexa playing Barry White. <laughs> you got me now, Tim. I'm coming over you. Yeah. And yeah, and it's, I love it. That's, I love it. So I don't, I'm slightly nervous about Alexa. So I, I do think, and, and phones, I do think they listen to you. I don't, I've got to be careful what you say, you know what I mean? And it has been kind of proof that some couple in America did a thing where they went, Oh my God, how's the cat? We went, Oh my God, the cat, how's it? They haven't got a cat. <laughs> and they kept going about, the cat, the cat, oh, the cat needs feeding. Oh my God, we must take the cat to the vet. And then the, their uh, social media profile started to hammer them with uh, cat products and cat food. It's a test. So be careful. There was another famous woman who was, Alexa, do you work for the CIA? And he goes, you. And it shuts down. <laughs> Check that out. Alexa, do you work for the CIA, FBI? And so it's there, it's a watch. Do you work for the FBI? You. <laughs> Just what, he's done a noise that you've never heard before. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's Big brother. brother. Yeah, like, that's my favourite gadget at the moment. I've grown up out of silly things like a... Oh, God, do you know what like the... There's, that, there's, there's still, I'm trying to think of some of the weirder things. I bought a robotic vacuum cleaner before they... Before well, they were square ones. No, circular one that you kind of, you leave it, and it, it's like this lawnmower, isn't it? Where you, you just leave it. It's a robot, really. But there's, there's two, they can do, they go either parallels, G, up, and down, and back, and up. You can program that, or you can pro program spiral, which starts in the middle, and it comes out in a spiral and cleans. Well, I plugged it in, I'm so excited. I bought it online. <sighs> plugged it in, I charged it up overnight, 24 hours. I turned it on and it went, and I went oh, great, and went, <laughs> just like Alexa. And it never worked again. Worth it, yeah. And I didn't wrap it up. That's the thing about online, you know, like packaging it all up and sending it back. That's one thing about retail I love. Is you can just go, you don't bloody work, you know what I mean? Look, well, oh, I'll get you another one. It's like, it's like, you know, I've chucked the box away. What am I going to wrap it up in a towel? Do you know what I mean? Oh, uh, so, no, I just Uber up now. <laughs> got Henry, like, Uber, 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 Uber up. up. It was just a, a bad thing. You Uber up? Oh, I Uber up. You yeah. made? Sure, it's made. Oh, every fortnight, yeah, I have a lady comes in. Yeah, but I do, no, in the, in, the, in the interim time, I, I do it. 
I have a dust buster in the kitchen, which has a, it's a hoover. It's a dust buster and it clips in like that, like Arnie. Oh, How did you start talking about the hoover? Well, I am a bit OCD, I'm OCD tidy, so. Not germaphobe, but because I did the voiceover for obsessive compulsive cleaners and it did it made me question myself quite a lot. But when I leave the house, no matter what, well, I've been on the blind on the bed watching telly tonight, and I've got scatter cushions on the on the bed, and I turn one the other way round just to rest my head on it. But when I leave the house, I have to have it exactly as it was, <laughs> not how I've left it. So that when I walk in the room tonight, I go, ah, oh, but I go, Alexa, relax, relax. <laughs> <laughs> Then I walk in and go, ah, yeah, I don't like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I could never have a sink full of dirty water. You're not looking at that, that's uh, right. Everything's right. <laughs> but there were some things on, 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 on um, obsessive compulsive truck cleaners. One thing I thought, ooh, that's good, I like that. And I tried it, and it's, it's, it's flawed. It's ironing your duvet cover on the bed. You know, because you get that creased. Well, for a start, it doesn't work because it has to be slightly damp, and then, then you can't have a damp thing on a bed because it's not hygienic, do you know what I mean? So, it's a lot of rubbish. Don't, don't do it. Don't. Did There's you know, no iron that's strong enough to get the... Do you not work talking about this. <laughs> right, let's get on the theme. Right, here we go. <coughs> so, drama, acting, yeah. a, a talent for performance. Where did you find that? When did that... Who, is anyone in this... Well, you know, you said you were adopted, so... Mum did that, mum did that. Mum did Mum did that, I'm as a dramatic in the village, at the village hall. So mum from there? So mum mum did a bit of that. My dad's a scientist, he was a humist. Uh, he's a physicist. And he got a first class honours degree at humist in the 60s. He was head of the student union. Oh, in the 60s. Yeah, in the, the, 60s. 60s. Yeah, uh, in the humist. And Anna Ford, the newsreader, was yeah. head of humanities. Uh, so dad was friends with Anna Ford. So that's my adopted dad. And uh, he's a great man, he's got great wisdom and I love him to death and he's, he give me, he's instilled a great sense of, uh, uh, what's the word, justice in me. You know, fairness, uh, you know, firm or fair, brilliant, 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 man. very intelligent. Uh, my mum, lovely, very caring, uh, but, but, but she uh, did ballet as a child and uh, I used to go and watch her do I was dramatics. But it was a night, it was only a little, and I used to go, that's my mummy! <laughs> Shout it out when she was. I remember the show she did. My scary was called Dark Lucy, it was called. And it was a bit witchy, and I was like, I didn't mm, like my mum being in that. Like, yeah. So, uh, then, so on the village hall used to put on shows. So they would, they, people would dress up in, sing them old Victorian music hall songs. I don't know if you, we sang these at school. Oh, I mean, yes. you remember like, oh, I'm Henry the Eight Fire, and all that. Henry, 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 we did all those songs, you know, like. You are the honey, honey, so high on the We used to sit in class singing these songs. I mean, the ancient, ancient, old, old songs. And uh, they used to do a bit of that and do a variety show. And he said, John, would you do, uh, would you do a turn? And I went, yeah, all right. And I loved Tommy Cooper and I loved Frank Spencer. And at the time, I couldn't really do a very good Cooper because I was so little. But I could do Frank Spencer, you see. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's the one that everyone starts with. <laughs> So I did, I kind of did a hybrid, I did a Frank Cooper. <laughs> I did a Tommy Spencer. And it was Frank Spencer doing magic tricks that went a bit wrong. I remember one, I had a magic wallet, and I went, has anyone got any money in the audience? And so I went, yeah, here you go, and he gave me five pence. I'd uh, like a five pound note, please. And he gave me five pound note, what you did, you turned it, you, you closed the wallet, and then reopened it, and then it was gone. But the thing is, that was it. I was like, thanks for the night. Uh, well, that was like 1970s. That was a lot of money for a five year old. I was only about six years old. And you had a five. I had a five. So with inflation, that was a good gig. Very well paid, you know what I mean? So uh, that was my first parade. Then I got asked to be a. M I used to watch Rupert the Bear on TV, which was string puppets at the time, very basic. And they did a show, God, I can't imagine what the show was like. It was at the Charter Theatre in Preston, and it was puppets on strings. Fucking, it was a bit shit. Do you know what I mean? God, no kid would watch that now, would it? I mean, it just got, it's heartwarming to think that we, but the, do you know what I mean? How far away it must have been, they're it. Anyway. And he was warm up as a magician and he asked me on stage and I was his assistant for the night and he goes, anyone in the audience and I went like that. And he got me up and I loved it. Right. I absolutely, I'll never forget, I was giddy. It was one of those moments. It was yeah. That kind of moment. That was it. You knew this is me. This is it. 
the this glory is, this is what I want to do. I absolutely was high, uh, uh, unbelievable. And I thought, oh, this something's happened here. This is this is great. This and uh, and I did at school. I'd forgotten that the first show I did at primary school when I was probably ten. Well, I was faking in Oliver, wow. which is an incredible part to play. Ten year old, the beard and the hat and everything. One of those said you were great. So I did that. And then at school I did, I was like a small part when I was in, the, in the younger years in, in my fair lady. I think I was one of the big men with, you know, I'll get you married in the morning, one of them. And then the next thing I did was Joseph in Joseph and his amazing set called Drinko. And then I was Judas in Jesus Christ Superstar. So, uh, and that's not a eh? hard scene, Judas, though, really high. But, well, um, it's really, really high. I don't know how I did it, actually. So, yeah, I do sing, but I don't kind of do it very much. Uh, I do a bit of karaoke occasionally. Still think they'll ever be musical. Yeah, yeah, Mr. yeah. Mr. Mr. Manfred's not a few, isn't he? Well, he has, and he's got a great, he's in 10 years, see, Jason. It's the rare. Yeah. I'm a high baritone, so there's more of us, uh, there's the kind of, you know, I can sing and I have sung before. The, the, one of the reasons why I've not kind of been tempted by touring on West End is it's time away from the kids. Yeah. And I, I kind of, I'd rather, that can come later. I have to say, knowing John as I have, um, Sam, his wife, said this year, they don't Ex-wife. Ex-wife, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, ex-wife. Yeah. Yeah. Still very good friends, but did describe you as a great <laughs> dad. Really, right? I'm going to be controversial and cause me hours of, of pain and... We're getting on fine. <laughs> and yeah, really well. It's been a tricky four years, it's uh, <laughs> But it's better now. It is but she did say, and it's she a learning was, curve. She described you as a fabulous father the other day, which I thought was very well, nice. Well, that's, I'd like to, oh, that's very nice, that's lovely. I'll, 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 I'll say that. You'll say that. My, well, my, kids, kids, my kids will, my daughters will, will vouch for that, yeah. They're at that age, or one of them's at that age now, though. Are your boyfriends been around? No, not at all. Well, we used to say, no. One sixteen, one's eight. So sixteen year old. We said, well, basically, we said, uh, we said chewing gum at you can have chewing gum at eight, ears pierced at ten, a phone at eleven, and a boyfriend at thirty five. <laughs> That's the one. That's the one. I've never had children. If I had, the doors would be locked up until she was forty. Yeah, that is a worry to me, but she's dead fussy. She's got a lot of interest, but she's. I love the fact she's really, really fussy, and I like that about her. Yeah. So the likes boys who have common interests, which is great, not on looks alone. Well, he's not the best looking dad, but he likes Hamilton the musical. I went, ah, oh, well, because they're obsessed with that. I don't know if you know about it. Do you know Hamilton? It's a, a hip hop musical. It's a rap. Sorry, I forget that. Yeah. Um, it's a hip hop musical that's like taking the world by storm, Broadway and. Uh, and I've seen, I'm very lucky to, because I'm in the business, I, I get a lot of a few perks, so I can get tickets for this. That's a pay. I used to get perks, but I don't get money anymore. Right, uh, start, start to pay some dollar. Do you know how much, you know Harry Potter could have played was then? Cursed Child. Uh, so my, for my daughter's 16th birthday, she's Harry Potter. Uh, Sam went with me, yes, and uh, my, my daughter, Sophia, who's eight. Four of us, it's two shows. First show's two hours, 45 minutes long, the first show. Two hours, it's a 20 minute interval. Didn't eat it. Two hours forty five minutes, then there's a two hour interval and then it's another two hours forty five. Right? What did you do for two hours in it? You go to eat somewhere in Soho because it's up in the palace. But that cost me a thousand quid. It's a grand. Use your agents, they need to slap. That, that was for house seats. That's it, yeah, 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 to get that. So all I'll say is I've got good seats, you know, good sight lines, but I'll pay I don't mind paying full whack. How well have you got done today? Yeah. <laughs> I'm done with this. Jesus, thousand pounds. Thousand quid. <laughs> Two hundred fifty quid per show per ticket. I was so shocked. That that there, London. That there, I. <laughs> well, I did a seven-year stretch in London, uh, but I didn't. I didn't take to it really. I missed the warm. You did what? This is it. You're one of these. You know, Absolutely. You are probably one of the few, actually, that hasn't been to London. You've stayed true to your roots. I went and to London. It's certainly a stretch in London. South East London. I, I, I chose South East London because uh, the, very, the thing about the South East, you're all a bit like, you know, the characters, the very characterful. It's kind of like yeah. different parts of London have got different kinds of, uh, you know, West London, very kind of hard to explain, really. North, aspirational, 
kind of there's, it's weird. It's very, very. There's an obsession with class in, in London, which annoyed me intensely. It's like you're a person, you're not. You know, it's like you know what class we is. And, and something that, until I moved there, I never even contemplated class as a as an issue. You know what I mean? They're obsessed with it. But say I based them, and they're all like, "Come on, all right, mate. You know, I do what." He goes, "You're a laughing chap," and all that. And I like that kind of. They have some of the best expressions. Uh, that my mate Wisey, he's one of the reasons why I stopped. Well, one of the reasons that, I, that kept me going not drinking and was carrying on was he went, oh, I had a right old weekend, you know. I was here yeah, going to the club down and getting some of that damn you know, fucking some of that. <laughs> Put it all full of salts down and being hard clean and started it all again Saturday, Sunday morning, going right through all of Sunday, Sunday night, having it large, VIP, salts, some of that, some of that. Fucking <laughs> all it was blinding. And I went, wow, what a weekend was. And then he went, tell you the truth, we want all that. <laughs> and I just never forget that. Tell you the truth, we want all that. You see the pain, the pain, the misery, the memory, the come down, just, they want all that. I mean, and this is another thing that, I mean, I don't know how many of you know John's sister, we've known each other quite a while, as I said. I remember once we were at a party with little Kenny Baker. Uh, we were out one night. His son, that was the show. That was the normal height. His son is normal height. Totally normal height. Kenny was R2-D2 in, uh, in Star Wars. He also in one of my favourite films, Time Bandits. And a fabulous I love that film. He, we, we had an eye out on these shows, parties at when I was showbiz, by the way, Gav. Uh, I used to get invited to all kinds of things. Really, I think that's what we're well, missing now, John. I've not got any. I don't know. It's his politics. Oh, they're right. all the same. It's shite. It is politics. Honestly, it, it's just... Seeing through sober eyes those nights, it's no wonder people drink, it's to get through the fucking night! <laughs> They're awful! They're all the same! It's just... Shining! A lot of the time it's like being invited to a wedding where you don't know anyone. You know when you sat on the table and got a car doing your name and go... Who the hell's that? And they turn up and they go, hello. I'm in paint. <laughs> and I go, oh, all right. I don't even remember all the lines. I'm like, oh my god. I've got this for four hours. Oh, don't. I just, I, I, I just, I do my charity bit, but I just kind of like, some people love it, but I. You've got the kids though, I think that's been a big thing. Of course it has, yeah. And, and the children. Yeah, yeah. It's just a game changer having kids. It's like, I, I love horror films, and I like, I like, you know, all kinds of. I used to love all the, like, Arnie and, and, you know, all them kind of quite violent, uh, you know, fake violence and fake horror and all kinds of horror. But when I had kids, I had to admit, admit my appetite for it waned somewhat. Do you know what I mean? There's a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Not so what's it now? Harry Potter. No, no, I still like my horror. I still love it. Uh, what do I like now? Well, Peppa Pig, oh God, I need to know that off my heart. Peppa Pig's great though, Peppa Pig. It's the laughter's real, you see, that's what I love it. The laughter of the kids, it's, it's real and it makes you laugh. That's why it's so good. Um, I've missed out on all this. I've only got a dog. Well, he wants to eat crusts. You enjoy that then? I like crusts. Yeah, I can't take him to crusts, it'd be a fucking disaster, he'd kill everything. <laughs> He's a lunatic, because like most of the people who work know him and work with him will attest he's a clean idiot. But I digress. So, when we met Kenny Baker, they're like, no, that was a night where there was a bit of friction, and some guys came in trying to take photographs of you because it was a joke all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, the only funny thing about it was Sam lost his temper. Sam's a feisty lady, John's ex. And from <laughs> the cross, all hell broke loose. And the next thing is, me and John looking back, and I suddenly looked, and all I could see was little Kenny Baker getting squashed. So I dived across the table, grabbed Kenny Baker, and I'm hanging there, and all I could think was, I've just saved R2D2. <laughs> and that was one of our first nights out there. And then at the end of the night, he gave me a business card on it, this is brilliant. And on the business card, it went, Kenny Baker. R2-D2 stole from a galaxy far, far away. No one says Amos. I shat myself laughing. Literally. So yeah, those days, I might say, they were good, but fun. Oh yeah, well, no. Press club. Well, I met my ex-wife in the, in the press club. Jeez. And um, I said, what are you doing here? 
I know, it's a donkey. And, um, if you don't know what the Press Club is, like the Press Club, it's gone. It was a fantastic... It's a working men's club, really. <laughs> Fresh workers, wasn't it? But it was originally, but it ended up being like the, the, the haunts of the proper showbiz folks around Manchester. And they, you'd have the posh caps like the Cirque Lines to DJ in and just be surrounded by football players and prostitutes. Uh, and then you had the press club where the toilets were literally foot deep in piss. And that was just the ladies, excuse the French girls. And it was it, Joe, the woman at the front, used to sit there with her glasses like that. Yes, she looked like uh, the one from Birds of a Feather. Yeah, and she'd just sit there. The long one. And these two huge the women, and she just. One day look at you and think, nah. <laughs> it was like, like four knocks to try and get into this place. Oh, really? Stupid clock in the morning. It's six o'clock, really easy. But what it was, it became, it was originally for the people that worked on the papers late at the night, late at night, you know. And, uh, uh, it was for them. And, um, well, it was what it also became was because the theatre shows came down late. And loads of cats and all of that. Yeah, they go in. Karaoke, that's karaoke. The karaoke night yeah, was really good. That's a Thursday night. They enjoyed it, Sal. Come on, girls, we're having a show here. You see? Nice. I think you're a bit later, thank you. So the karaoke nights in there were legendary. Who's the guy that was a. So it's like, Ron Phoenix night, nice, isn't it? Yeah, well, they were a legend. 24 hour party. Black guy, white guy, all that. It's not a bird rice on show, by the way. Not a bird rice. I'm against a bird, it don't do me yet. But the press club, we have some nights out in there, so you don't, I, I don't miss it. I miss aspects of it sometimes I'll see and think, could have invited me, the bastards, but uh, I'll pass it myself, I think. But you still get invited to them, and obviously, as I said, we're sat in the pub, and as I asked you earlier, when we sat at the back, in the green room, I said to you, do you find it difficult being in a pub? Because you did have, you know, you fought through 12 years. 12 years he's been sober, was it this year? Yeah, 12, 12 years. 12 years sober. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's a hell of an achievement, and like you said, you know, it, it, it must be difficult coming into a pub. And it was only posted the fact that I'd asked you to do this, and you very kindly agreed. Um, that I thought I don't have a problem with pubs at all, but there's not for, there's absolutely no reason for me to be in one anymore. And uh, they say don't hang around pubs. People go, there's a, there's a thing they say uh, at AA. Um, uh, they say uh, if you hang around the bar as long enough, you'll end up getting an haircut. Right, which means like it's all right you going in there drinking soft drinks, but one day it's right go. I, I, do, you, do you wanna? No, I, you know, I'll go above for a purpose. So I'm here for to do this. So I'm, I'm you know, completely comfortable in a pub. I don't start to like melt like the witch for the West and want to step over the threshold. So I'm absolutely totally comfortable in a pub. I don't play darts. I don't really play pool. I love a quiz. We do a good quiz. I do a good quiz. Last night. Oh, I do a good quiz. Um, you know. So, I mean, I will go in a pub, but as I've always said, drinking is not a spectator sport. No. And I don't, I tend to... Another thing is if you're recognised, if you're... I don't like the word celebrity, to be honest, because there are a lot of people out there... Celebrate, celebrity comes from celebra, which is set to celebrate. So, in, I used to like the 1970s kind of mantle that were given to uh, famous people, which was TV personality. Because one, they were on TV, and two, they had a fucking personality. <laughs> now, there are ce celebrities. It's just pitiful, really. I get asked to do a lot of those shows. Uh, Dancing on Ice recently, and I said, no, I said, I'm not doing that. Because I said, one, I went, <sighs> I just said, the worst thing is, they pay more than drama. Jesus. Uh, yeah, it's just a horrible world. It's a real horrible thing to be in that make that situation, you know. Do I, what, do, what do I do, you know? But it, the problem is now, it's back in the day when they first started all these shows, you'd have quite good people you could be on with, but now there's a wheel of shows yeah. where it is just one goes to the other. So it's X yeah, off the beach, uh, Love Island, Towie, you know, and it's like... You know, at the beginning when they introduced the, the people, even young people are going, Who's that? <laughs> Who's he? What's that? Who's that? What's he off? Who's he? I, Who's? Would, I would say this year, I think I, yeah, I get promised to obviously get me out of the The jewel was quite good. Was it alright? I watched this year for the first year. I tolerated it. I still love that, but. See you on that. Sure, I did it. No, I've never done that. Career suicide. It is no, it's career suicide. That's when you're down, that's when you're all right, all right, thanks. Yeah. I don't know. Why would you go and do that? 
I'll say one thing. I'm not I'm fearless, right? And I'll, I'll do. I've done. Uh, Jack Osborne's a drowning junkie. There's no, nothing on that show I wouldn't do, right? Nothing. Nothing I wouldn't eat. No stunt. No thing I wouldn't do. Because I'm not afraid, afraid of anything. Maybe except my ex-wife, right? So. <laughs> Spies, snakes, crocodiles, anything, all that, right? Everyone goes, oh, wow, great, you know. Well, what do you do? One of the things about when you get sober, sort yourself, sort your head out, is you've got to know yourself, right? You have to know yourself and know what you're about. And when you know what you're about, you know you can make proper decisions in life. And I'll tell you why I won't do that stuff to get me out of here. It's because I hate mosquitoes. Absolutely. <laughs> Love me. They love me. I'm, I'm head to tail eating for them, right? And they absolutely love me, and it's crawling with them, right? Secondly, I um, I I'm, uh, I'm an old golf shy. I don't stop talking, right? And in those circumstances, all you've got is conversation, right? But there are times when I get on my own nerves, right? <laughs> and in that situation, because it's so, you know. Like prison, people go and be like, John, what's in the show? You know what I mean? And it upset me to see that, you know what I mean? It would upset me that people, me trying to be interested and entertaining and kind, will be misinterpreted and then they go, we fucking shut up, you know what I mean? <laughs> so the mozzies, that, and humidity I can't stand, are useless in heat. I love being cold. I like it, that's why I won't go. I don't, I'd rather be really cold than really, really hot. But I'm very, very warm blooded, and that's maybe what the mozzies like me. So, with that in mind, mosquitoes, humidity, and I can't, you know, verbal diarrhea. There's absolutely no way I'm going to. No way. Where no are you with that? Cold feet. Yeah. Cold yeah. feet. Yeah. There you go. Apologies. Apologies, Tony. I just want to be here. I love cold feet. And when you did the first series of it, I remember when you were doing the last, the last shots, I was living in that house opposite the uh, Duke's 92. And uh, yeah. you were filming with uh, with your partner in crime there, your Irish friend. Yes, yes. Mr. Nesbitt. Mr. Nesbitt. And you sat, I lived in the front window of this big, I don't know you know Castlefield in, in, in Manchester, the big, um, the, the house there, the, the lock keeper's the cottage. Lock cottage. Try living in the lock keeper's cottage where your surname's lock and it's on the locks and fucking taxi and they tell you to fuck off. <laughs> Not easily. No. Anyway, we lived in that house, and my mate Johnny stood up. But it was known as a very much a party house for a while, wasn't it? Absolutely. It was. That's where we first met, because it was... Uh, but your front garden is a beer garden. A fucking beer garden. <laughs> in the summer. Honestly, it was the noisiest place I've ever lived in. I got an, an absolute hatred of Canadian, Canada geese. I see one now and I'll smash the fucking heads in. <laughs> I hate them, they're everywhere, they're shit, it's crazy. It's awful, they don't ever lived in town, in the middle of town. I just left. That. I don't know I've ever lived in town, in the middle of a town. They collect the glass bottles, don't they? At four in the for why four or five in the morning? Not you know when you sometimes anymore. throw a, a bottle in the glass bin and it goes, and you go, ooh, and you give it and goes, and you go, so loud, that. Imagine 400 of the things, right? <laughs> That was fantastic. That. If I could put some delay on that, you'd nailed it. That's the noise. <laughs> living in town, that's the noise. That's the noise of wake you That's a fucking geese when you live in Castlefield. Oh. But when you were filming that, I remember one day, and I'd been living in that house a while, and I, I liked to party. It was that, it was that, I was at the comedy store, I was going to wherever, they'd knock him out with Paddy McGuinness before he got married. Jesus wept. And he'd just go in. <laughs> To do basically, we met there. It was a, it was a music event. I think it was that um, big uh, deep percussion, and that you came into the camp. And me and you sat and had a drink. That's the what white lion. Yeah, no, it was. Uh, you've been there. You came in the house. You came. Me, you came to have a look around the house because yeah, you've not seen it. Oh, well, that's you live in here. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The lad that lived with us, Johnny Woods, is a legend. You've never met him, but those who know him will tell you he's a legend. Uh, and he built a bright pink DJ booth as big as this in the... Oh, he's over there. There he is. Yeah, Johnny. Hey. Johnny Woods, the legend. Do you know what happened to Johnny? Johnny came to my old house. Uh, my old house uh, where, where my ex-wife was with my children. And Johnny was just turning the corner to come into the driveway and a fucking tree fell down. It just, the roots were rotten and it missed you, didn't it? And I went, even both went, what? And we just saw it go, hundred fucking quid. Honestly, if you'd been like, five minutes, two minutes before, 
He'd be brown bread. Shittest, shittest assassin I've ever had in my life. <laughs> Lumberjack Assassin. I'm going to get the end of this story. show for Netflix. Lumberjack Assassin, yeah. <laughs> so I was sat in this window of this, I mean, I lived in this window. And I could hear all this kerfuffle, it's early hours in the morning, I'm getting up for work. And I stood up and I'd sleep then, not now, but I slept generally naked. And I opened the curtains of the flat, not realising the window actually stopped around here. And as I looked out, there's a camera crew and there's everything. He sat looking like that, and Nesbitt's got his back to him, and the director goes, Cut! And I'm like, that goes, Close the curtains, sir, if you don't mind. Continuity. And I'm like, Yeah. I close the curtains, and suddenly this voice goes across the thing, and I'm not sure if it was you, and I don't know. On the big thing, Nice cock. <laughs> I was like, I've got to now walk out of here, I'm going to work, and try and get through the thing. And it was which I think you come back to do some edits. They couldn't see everything, unfortunately. You couldn't see everything. They saw everything, it was horrible. A lot of fun, the first time we met and down there, and that, that whole time was, was fun. But prior to all of this stuff, and how we kind of got to know each other, talking about, was Steve Coogan. You were with Mr. Coogan. And probably one of my favourite, if not my favourite character you played, was Fat Blob. You fat floppy bastard. Have yeah. a round of applause for fat Bob. Yeah. Yeah. What was that like? And how fit was Paul Lee Goff? Uh, Have you ever no. find her attractive? No, not my slightest. No, not at all. Absolutely not. Not my type. I don't know. I've got some Seriously. Plastic. kind of bird than that. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. For me, that was a. We won the Perrier in '92. And we've done character hey. comedy. Thanks. We've, won, we've done character comedy. Uh, together on tour before. I mean, we, we used to drive a Golf because uh, it was a hatchback, so we could get elected in it in a projector screen for Ernest, the you know, health and safety ball that he used to do. <laughs> so we, we, we literally, I mean, we drove to fucking Aberdeen and there was hardly anyone in. There was only about like 20 people came to see us, and, and but we did the graph, we put the graph in. Anyway, we won the Perrier and then we decided to take Paul Golf on the road. Now, Paul Calf, as for those of you who didn't know, he came up with that character when we were at drama school. We were, we were in, based in Didsbury, and the, it was Manchester Polytechnic School of Theatre, and the pub's still where they knocked down the theatre, it's a shame. It was listed, it's a beautiful place, it was ABC Studios for Granada, and it, it, sh it was listed because the Beatles did one of the first TVs there, as did Bob Dylan, and it had an amazing history. Anyway, the back, it was a backhander in the middle of the night, it was bulldozed, it was horrific. But the Parswood's still there. Steve used to go in the Parswood and listen to people with a snook. And they'd be like, oh, this is just a fucking hell. And he, and he was observed, do you know what I mean? But it was bought. For, for, a, for a drinking man's pub, right? Students is one thing, but drama students. Oh. Well, my check off really isn't working out for me today. And I'm like, oh. You fucking check off! <laughs> but that's where Steve kind of, he, he got that Paul Carr, that's where he got Paul from. But the beauty of doing Paul Carr video diaries and the beauty of doing um, two fights, was it three fights, two went into the funeral? Three fights. Um, was, it was a video diary, so, and it was, it was the best acting tuition for me, starting out, I could possibly have because we had to make that real. We had to make those video diaries look like a video diary. Not not actors, real Salford punters who just filmed themselves getting up to, you know, whatever they did. So we what and the way we did it, John, was we had a great director, Jeff Posner, we rehearsed the shit out of it. Rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it and rehearsed it. And rehearsed it. So it's totally like a play. So we knew it so well, it just came like you do in your sleep. So it came out so naturally. And that's when I realised when, when, when I was an actor that the, a good act is, is a confidence trick. That's all it is. And it's about being able to mimic the emotion in such a way that it's totally believable. It's about truth. It's, acting is telling stories, but, but as truthfully as possible. And then when you tell that ultimate truth to your audience, you, they engage with you, you've got them, because they're there, they're laughing with you, they're crying with you, they feel for your character. So a good piece of drama is where, you're, where, where your audience are there with you, and they're feeling with you. You know, you see films and you go, well, I didn't really feel for the characters, do you know what I mean? You see them and you go, no, I didn't, no. Um, performance. 
it was just kind of you don't believe what they're doing, it's not believable. I remember in, the, in, in that shit, in that episode where Fat Bob actually gets to the camera and it's the one she's talking about, and he actually is upset and tells Pauline that he loves her. Am I correct in remembering that, or have I just made? I think he does tell her. He tells her he loves her. was actually. I did have to snog Steve. What was that like? What was that like? And you didn't fancy Pauline, but I wish snog Steve. I wish you'd have a mint. I wonder what he says about you. <laughs> so, Mr. Coogan, then, what, I mean, you know, do you still see each other? Yeah, very much. Um, I saw, I went to his house at Lewis in Sussex, uh, one evening, Steve. and he invited me, Steve, not drink anymore. And, um, we bring out the devil in people, you know what I mean? I tell you, it, it does. It really brings out the devil in people. I know, in my whole life, I've known two people who were actually better when they were the drink. But that's probably because they're, they're normally always drunk. But, you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? I only know two people in my entire life, the last 15 years this year, that are all right. Most people, they could become sated. You're only 50 this year? Yeah, I'm 50 this year. Good looking boy. Good looking boy. Well, I have to, I'll have to look after myself um, because people go, oh, cool, you look so well. I am an advert for sobriety. I have to be fucking looking all right. I want you to have what I've got if you're struggling. You want to want what I've got. If I look like shite, you go, oh, get a fucking Stella. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I am an advert for sobriety, that's why. I I like a, a health spot, I like a facial, I like my nails being done. You know, you I did. like, you I groom. You know, I saw that picture, you won an award last night, by the way. I did. Because my won an award at the North West Comedy Awards. As uh, North West Comedy Legend. I did, I did. It's funny though, I look at the pictures of myself because I've got a bit, I've, I've got a bit of a sound. Uh, a bit, you're looking golden. I do look quite, I, I didn't realise, maybe I've maybe I've got a back I know, a bit, but, but I, I, I look to myself, I look like, I look like a very successful Greek restaurateur. <laughs> He knows bar and grill, mate. Yeah, Somebody know. said it was Hardy St. Coley. Hardy said to me, Sorry, okay, it's no. Manchester's Oliver Reed. <laughs> and I went, it's been said it before. Yeah, it's been yeah. said before. A lot of people have said, my God, Oliver Reed. Which, which is something I'm going to work well, on. Yeah. Yeah. Are you ready here? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to start writing. I I I'd like to do a biopic of, of Oliver. I've got a great comic book upstairs. I'll, I'll lend it to you. Okay. Please, it's fab fabulous. So, so going back, Steve, we were talking about, weren't we? Yeah, you so, Steve. Yeah, Steve's just on Stan and Ollie. I don't know if you've seen it. It's absolutely oh, a beautiful film. What a film! Fantastic. It's a love story. Uh, it's it's heartbreaking. It's brilliantly performed by John C. Riley and Steve. I saw it to a screening of it yeah. uh, at, in London. The only bad part of that, though, Steve was there. Uh, because I've seen it on, I'm a BAFTA member, so I get sent DVD screeners. So I've seen 50 films since October. Seriously, thank God I was on my arse, not working. So I've watched most of them. <laughs> and if you want any tips, I'd say my favourite is Green Book. It's absolutely my number one film. It's so brilliant, right? It's absolutely, standing all is excellent. But Green Book, oh, it's a fantastic film. You must see it. Um, I went to the screen they started on and I was there. There was pre-drinks, it was at the Soho Hotel, they had a little cinema in there. And they went to me, Hey John, what are you in it? And I went, Oh no. <laughs> so what are you playing in it? And I went, um, oh, 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 and it was like quite seven people went, Oh, I didn't know you were in it. Oh, I'm not. So it's kind of a bit difficult when you've got that association with Steve. They're like, why, why, why are you not in it? And we start out as Steve, you know what I mean? But it's all right, I'll buy my time. My time, you know what I mean? It's fine. It's, it's, it's uh, but it's when people were saying it, I'm like, okay, I'm not, look, I'm not in it. All right, it's okay. It's okay, I'm not in it. It's okay. Did you, did you punch anyone? No. <laughs> no. It was a, have you seen Stan and Ollie? Have you seen it? Yeah. If you're not seeing it, go and see it. Oh, it's, I, it is amazing. I watched it down on the view and I sat and cried at the end of it. It's absolutely It's like they're alive again. It's quite yeah. incredible. The makeup, they go really tight. Prosthetic makeup now is so special because they go in really close yeah. and it's skin. You wouldn't know. But it's the devil's in the detail, and those performances are very, very, really studied. Steve's up for a bath director for his performance in that. I, I, well, after watching it, I thought he really should be going. It was, one of the Steve, Steve really emerged as an actor in Philomena. He was amazing. You know? yeah. Yeah, he was very, very good in that, Steve. But, because before, there's always a bit of uh, Alan Partridge in there. <laughs> You, you can always hear it in the background. There's always a bit like, ah, oh, ha, ha, you see. And, and Dave, Stephen Free is the director, has clearly said to Steve, 
I'm watching you and I don't want any uh -huh. <laughs> It's like, the, it's like the Bruce Willis and you, isn't it? When he used to do it in every, every film, we do that. Hey, Bruce Willis, that. Man, and every, it's freaky, yes. And then what's his face? Grant, Grant Mitchell, what's his name? Thingy. Grant Mitchell. What's the actor? What's his name? Ross Kemp. Ross Kemp does all those. I'm behind him with a bunch of. Oh, yeah. Brothers, Ross, you know? Ross Kemp never sit in the same room as Nucky Bear. <laughs> well, it's like Peter Andre. Never sit in the same room as Emu. <laughs> I love what you like this. <laughs> right then, so we're going on about Steve Coogan. Who, he went out with a friend of mine once. He went out with a girlfriend, an old friend of mine. And the law of averages, that's quite likely. Yes, <laughs> not a girlfriend of mine. Uh, and uh, I remember. I Steve met, is a known heterosexual. Oh, an absolute heterosexual. And I met uh, we were, I was doing the comedy store stuff, and I was doing around Manchester Comedy Festival. And I was at the circle, and Steve came in, and he was being a bit showbiz. And I'd give him monkeys. I walked up and said, Why don't you do something for me at the festival? I went, I don't know, I could be in you know, Hollywood and anything could be busy on it. And I went, oh, don't be, don't be a wanker. And he looked at me in the first half and I went, anyway, do you remember Emma Putney? And he just went, Emma? And he went, oh my God, how do you know Emma? I went, good friends for years. Please now you've got a number. And he changed completely like that straight well, away. And that's how I get him a gig, you see, now. Yes. Yeah, sort him out with a bird. Yes. Tell him Emma's coming, I told him Emma. Oh, Emma. Emma, lovely girl. Anyway, moving on. You also, in your career, um, and I've asked you this before, we did a, an interview years ago for a TV thing, uh, and you worked, you, Henry Normal, Steve, Caroline and her, started out together, doing comedy shows, I believe, and you did Bang on the Wall. Yeah, we did. Oh, it was hard. It was, uh, well, we were all doing our own bit, we were doing our shtick, we were kind of doing, Caroline was doing, Caroline started, bless her, I still really can't believe she's gone, actually. It's terrible. It's just really, it's just kind of, it's too weird, do you know what I mean? It's very, very, so I've not really dealt with it really because she just vanished off the face of the earth and the tabloids have got the same man. They've got blood on their hands. They, because they, they targeted her so badly. I mean, I'm, I'm a victim of the tabloid. Intrusion. I mean, for anyone who wants to be famous, be warned. Be warned. There's a price to pay with that fame. It's like anyone who does these reality shows, you know, singing shows or anything, they just go straight in. Straight in, they're looking, you know, oh, his dad was in prison or, you know what I mean? So be warned that, you know, if you want fame, I mean, the, the, they'll come after you, you know what I mean? But, poor Caroline, yeah, she, uh, it was so hard. I mean, I, I'd stayed in touch, but she just didn't want to, she just was reclusive, literally, you know, reclusive. She's just, very quiet. I remember her last comedy, she won the Les Dawson one. I did her last job with her. I worked with her. She played my wife in it. Wow. Yeah, she was in it after hours, and I was her husband, and she, uh, she, she was my husband, my, I was her husband, and she was Sheila. And I sang Sheila, take a bow to her, and I think, that's all I learned to play the guitar as well, properly. Wow. And she was in that, and she was, she was in remission then, and I got a phone call saying, that's not good, so I come back, and I was like, oh. And Patrick died, the brother of it, just before Christmas as well. So that poor family, God bless their souls, it's just been hard. Anyway, I'm a lighter now. Caroline started out as a thing called a Mitzi Goldberg experience, and it was shit. <laughs> just terrible. It was just like a, her in, a, in an acrylic blonde wig. Kind of Dolly Parton-ish. Uh, it was just... I saw Do you remember it? I don't remember that. I saw a gateway theatre dressed as um, that mother... What was that character? Sister Mary Immaculate. Yes, I love that. that because I can't really hated learning anything, but she had a prayer book. All she got was a gut of jokes and a black book put a white tape cross on it. So she could just read the jokes, you know, when she was doing the character. And she was just reading them. Because she was like, no, I look at the book of prayer. I said, piece of jokes. She never bothered to learn them. <laughs> so Sister Mary, yeah. But we did a thing called, they spotted me and Steve and Caroline as being like the new, the, the next thing. It was Andy Harris who picked up Cold Figure and all that. And we did a thing called the, um, the Dead Good Show. And it was brilliant. And we all wrote it, and it, it would have gone, but then everyone broke away. So, Steve did Partridge, Mrs. Burton, oh, the Caroline went that way, and then I did, I think, Fashion, yeah. and bought Cold Feet. Nice. Great. Sorry. And, uh, it's all right, I don't mind. I had to. Everyone does it. Good. People do it in the street, they go, it's one of the hey, jazz man, they went, nice. And I go, great. And they go, yeah. <laughs> oh what was, what was the third one? What was the third one? Everyone knows it's nice and great. Yeah. It's not well, there's smoking. There's a few variations on the thing, but one thing I've never said, John, 
was jazz. I don't, I never said it. And then people go like that, and I'm with my kids, and they go, hey, jazz. And I go, hmm. And then I walk off, and so I look at the kids and go, I never said it. Never said it, never said it. I'm going to remind you. And I got never said it. I say it, I don't say it. I say smoking. I say, I got in trouble for this. I went, hmm, I can feel shite. <laughs> the reason being, I am a massive jazz fan and I play, I've been playing drums 38. We'll get onto that in a bit, but I've been playing drums 38 years and um, I do love jazz, but I'm not a big fan of trad jazz, which is Akavilk, Kenny. Kenny Ball. Kenny Ball is jazz, man. Yeah, it's, it's for the simple reason is uh, jazz, the jazz I like has a <laughs> double bass, not a sousaphone, which is the only instrument you can wear. So if you compare <laughs> to. Do you know what I mean? Now, on the coolometer. <laughs> to. <laughs> to see, you get it. And that's why it was Akabil. Shot. Shot. That's why. So. <laughs> A little bit about trad jazz, though. The fast show. The fast show was like, who liked the fast show? Yeah. Oh, look, good. Yeah. Everybody yeah. liked the fast show. I love the fast show. It, sounds, it still stands the test of time this, to this day. Yeah. I mean, there was the, the, that, the episode when when um, the, the, the two characters, the, the, I forget my memories, shattered by years of drinking, carrying on where you left off. And um, Sue, the, the farmer, and the. the, the oh, Ted and Ralph. Oh, that's. That, scene where he wanted to tell him he loved him and he just was like oh mate he just said that's amazing it, 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 um, i no. think my mum went john i went what i went i think it i went mum it's a bit ambiguous actually i couldn't say you know definitely for for sure but how much fun was that uh fast show just brilliant i mean uh, you catch a choose a catchphrase brilliant um it was Cheesy peasy. Oh, I love cheese. <laughs> cheesy peasy. There's one, and we, we, we built it, so it was cheesy peas. Come a combination of cheese and peas to make cheesy peas. But then we built on that, we had easy cheesy peas, right? <laughs> when, went for it. It gets better. So we started with cheesy peas, then it was easy cheesy peas. Do as you please with cheesy peas. <laughs> right? Wait. Guess better. Squeeze it, easy cheesy peas, in a squeezer. Do as you please with easy squeezy cheesy peas. Right? Then frozen, freezy easy cheesy squeezy peas. Then we did Channel 9, which is the little metadata thing. I know, yes, thought show and all that. But then we did an advert with, with them doing it, and it was chissy piss. <laughs> Chissy pissy, chissy pissy. <laughs> chissy pissy, chissy pissy. I mean, the joy that that's just in a rain. So there was one, it was 25 years this year. Someone's going to wet herself. That show was, for me, definitive. It was just... I became friends with a lot of musicians, famous rock and touring bands, because, because of that, that show, because it's their go-to tour bus DVD. Still. You know, yeah, well, well, but back in the not so much now. <coughs> so when I um, excuse me, uh, when I, uh, I a lot of the time I used to stay at the V and A in Manchester. It was owned by Granada, and each room had a name of a show that Granada had done. Coronation Street room literally had the three ducks up the wall. It was fantastic. Yeah, there was a Jew, there was a Coronation Suite. It was a suite, and he had a, a Andy Warhol, Julie Goodyear, bet bet. <laughs> yeah, the bar. There's a bar in there. Oh, it was tacky. Did you ever stay in the Brides at Rivers and Sitch Suite? No. Was it a good room? Never touched the teddy bear. Stank. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, no, I don't want to know what's happened to that. But one night, and Dave Spiker reminded Sorry. me, a couple went, he went, yeah, he went, bottle of champagne to 253. What, what's that? Only went cold feet. He went, I'll take that so. <laughs> so I took it up to the couple where, bloody hell! <laughs> They thought it was like, oh, seriously good here, isn't it? <laughs> like somebody in Vegas. They employ the people for the show to bring it. What? 
Oh, no, 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 and it was a death mask kind of uh, mould for a mask thing. And it was in a cabinet. Anyway, I got my one night, because there were no CCTV then. I got my Swiss Army knife out, and I undid it with a Phillips screwdriver. And I used to turn it, so it turns that, and then fasten it up. And then I overheard them going, no, the cleaners don't like doing the third floor. Well, I went, they, they don't like the third floor. Why? Well, I went, haunted. You're listening, Julie. That, that, that it moves, that thing. <laughs> I was turning it. One day I'd be facing the wall, and then it, it was me that was moving it. I went, oh, it's terribly haunted, the third floor. <laughs> so, oh, oh, happy days. Yeah, yeah, Fast Show. It's 25 years this year. Round of applause for Fast Show. Come on. Yay! Now, the BBC approached Paul and Charlie and said, you want to do something, right, special. So they went, yeah, all right, and they said, we'll do two half-hour specials, probably go out Christmas this year. Anyway, they went back with the budget, which wasn't anything silly. It was less than Gary Lenniker earns on a Saturday. <laughs> 1.75 million, right, it was less than that. And they said, no. Seriously? Yeah, and it wasn't the comedy department, it was the, the old school side. Our souls of uh, Yeah, but what the, the demand for that show? Mm. It would be so huge. It wouldn't be the same on Channel 4, though, would it, really? We'd, we'd, have to, we'd have to do BBC, but it's, it's about ownership, and, and you know, that's typical, you know, who owns what, and everything. <laughs> no, don't, 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 never say never. I really want to get this pushed through, really. I want it to happen. I really, really want it to happen. Have a campaign. We should start. Write right your MP. We'll start it here tonight. We'll write it down. Yeah, it should Bloody happen. BBC. It should happen. It should happen. It's quality, it's quality show. It's, uh, mate, I, it, my favourite character is not any of mine, clearly, because my ego's not a big, but uh, it's the drunk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rolly Birkin is that's an inspired creation, that is. Uh, I think that's Johnny Depp's favourite. He, he's a big fan of the show. We, we had him on it, actually. He did suit so you. But yeah, so many people were uh, were like, it was like, we don't write the catchphrases first and work backwards, it kind of just comes, you know what I mean? It was like, we don't, I don't, it just, Paul and Charlie wrote the jazz club bloke, but I fleshed him out, kind of thing. And one thing I did was uh, I, uh, I, I found great jazz names on the London Underground. So the players in the band go, Leicester Square on sax, right? So, and it's just great, there's loads. So you listen to it, I'm like, I'm getting get the map out. I'm like, oh, there's one. Um, uh, what was one of them? What was loads? Uh, Ongar on bass, Ongar's on the bottom of the central line. No one from, no, not make anyone from Ongar. Right. But it could be quite like, you know, a Swedish kind of uh, bass player. Oh, my name's Ongar, eh? The good player, no? Five Street bass. Uh, so that was great. <laughs> uh, that was good. Your musical instrument impersonations are incredible. Any uh, more you can do? Yeah, do drums. Uh, kind of Come on, please. <laughs> so. <laughs> bass drum. Uh -huh. Hey! It's quite funny, I'm talking about Sammy H. She posted something the other day about when you were there. Uh, who's the young lad that's on the uh, set series of Gold Fee? I'm terrible with names. The new one? Yeah. The place Jimmy's son? Yeah. Kel Spellman. He did a really nice read piece he went on Sunday brunch. Oh, it was really nice what he said. And, it was a, um, and then uh, the two presenters, obviously, uh, were on there. And they were just saying that they were. Yeah, Simon, I've done 25. Yeah, Simon, he is. Very good chef. Uh, and they were just saying that, the, that Tim had never experienced a night out with John, uh, and John, when he's out, entertains. And his kids did never and he said it was just they probably like paying you. He <laughs> so felt like he had to pay me at the end of the night. <laughs> uh, it's because we went to the rap party of uh, Celebrity Juice. And we got there, I've been in order, we're like dressing up, don't we? Some of them southern types, they're a bit scruffy. <laughs> So we all, went, we all went there suit the boot and nobody went. I don't know what it was. It was like crew, would it? Uh, we were just, it was just, Lee was there, Lee Keith Levin, and Emma Bunton, and that was it. And I was like, we saw, me and Simon and Tim were there. Tim Lovejoy from Sunday Brunch and Simon, we went, we'll give you 10 minutes more, see what else turns off. And we were like, I'm talking, nobody coming. 
Oh, it's a bit of memo gone round that we haven't got. Right, this party's going to be shit. So we went out. And uh, that was what that was that night we had together. We went to Soho House, which I've not been in a long time. And uh, what a brilliant night. A brilliant night. I had such a laugh with them, both of us. So well, we didn't go in a fight, though. Some horrible bugger. How did you get in a fight? No, with Tim, well, just, not oh, Tim, yeah. not Tim. Just it was a bar where there were stills, a, a posh club where there's round, a round bar with stills where we chatting like this, and just people trying to get in to get served. You know, and then the guy used to like, you know, take it up enough, take it up enough room, are you fellas? Comfortable, are you? And it's just like, oh fuck off, you know, there's space there, there's space there. You just wanted. And I was oh, kind of going, and my, temp, my temper was really starting to fret because this guy was being really rude, really personable. And Simon Ruiz just went, you just fuck off. And I went, oh my God, I've never seen Simon like that. He went, you heard me, fuck off. And I pulled as well, I went, and oh, he's I just, I was, I was just lunch. I was just so glad he said what I was thinking. <laughs> you didn't have to thump anyone then? No, we didn't, no. Good. Because you don't before there's a Northern Stereotypes. No, no, there's no fighting. No. No. I was, I DJ'd at Soho House a few times and what a shower of gets that was full of. Yeah, yeah. Horrible. Well, yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. yeah. Awesome. So it's not all bad. There's different. There's got lots of different. No, it was. Ones. It was horrible. Oh, anyway, no. talking about Northern, um, Bernard Manning. Yeah. For uh, for any of you who don't remember, do you remember uh, Bernard Manning? Yeah. Who could forget him in his vest? Um, Bernard Wrighton. Does everyone remember Bernard Wrighton? It's one of this man's most fantastic creations. How did Bernard Wrighton come about? And did Manning ever see him? Good, good question. Oh, good. The second, the, so, did Manning see I never went to the embassy because I'm there, glad Chris. Go on, open them up just to get them on. <laughs> I think you're like, oh, oh, just get them on. Get in there. I, I saw you, it was like, danger UXB. Or, 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 or is it a red wire? Is it green? I did the mobile phone, but I didn't do the Chris Paul. Oh, did I? Right. I could feel an orange in a pocket. Pocket <laughs> <laughs> out over the packet of crisps. <laughs> so, uh, oh, I'm going to come up with it. It was kind of just messing about at first. Because PC is such a big thing now. I mean, when I created that character, it was just kind of coming in, you know, political correctness. It was, it was, it wasn't as, it, I mean, it's, God, it's just got, it, it's, it, it's a pain to be honest, really, because it, it, it's 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 self defeating for a start. It, 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 it just winds people. It does. It's it, 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 I, I think there'll be a backlash. There has been. It was called Brexit. It's, it's just kind of yeah. There was a brilliant car. My mate said there was a brilliant car too with a fat dad sat watching something like that, and he went, "Dad," he went, "What?" He went, "Now all the foreigners have gone." He said, "Why don't why haven't you got a job?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking hell, that's right on the money, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, Bernard Wright, that's the only politics we're doing tonight. <laughs> Bernard Wright's on, so yeah, so Bernard Manning, we all know Bernard, and uh, I'd seen him shooting for the lip, I'd seen him do that, and I knew he was questionable, some of his politics was questionable. Bernard's argument against his particular style was, I have a go at everybody, no one's safe. He goes, I have a go about any, any, anyone. I have a race, creed, or anything. I'll, I'll have a pop at you. No one's safe. I won't well, have a go at handicapped kids, though. <laughs> he goes, nobody's safe. I'll have a go at anyone. handicapped kids, though. <laughs> I'll bet he fucking did. On the call. Anyway, it's... Uh, so... No. The new comedy was coming through. It's like Rick Mail and, and all those guys. They were just an alternative comedy. They don't call it that anymore. Comedy's just comedy, you know what I mean? It shouldn't be pigeonholed. They think it's just, you know. But it was the new kind of. It was very political, very left wing. It was very anti Thatcher. It was kind of. But one of the one of the the groundings of that new comedy, alternative comedy, was non sexist, non racist. Because it's not right, you know. We know that. We know it's not right. But there was the, still the hangover from the working men's clubs of those comics who needed to make a living. And the, it's no good preaching to the generation that's grown up with them and saying, we can't see them, we can't watch that. You've got to have democracy about this and let them, you know, let, let sleeping dogs lie, really. But I saw there was a hole in the market where, well, you're not allowed to say that anymore. Well, let's try and say what he says, but in a different way. <laughs> So my opening gambit was there's a black fella, a Pakistani and a Jew in a nightclub having a drink. People now 
When I first started it, people just went, oh shit. I mean, in London, I, I mean, I'm a lot more welcome up here. I've done not the store, but I've done a game like, the black fella, Pakistani, didn't you? And I've literally had, what about it? <laughs> Go on! What about you, fat northern monkey? And I went, wait for it. It's all about the time. <laughs> The black fella, Pakistan in a Jew, in a nightclub, having a drink. What a fine example of an integrated community. <laughs> so there you go. And that was where class. It came, and I got. I, I literally sat down with job books. Or, or, or I mean, I, I do have a, a quite comprehensive memory for, for a lot of jokes. So I, I just sat down, and what could I change? So it was things like. Oh, how many Pakistanis can you fit in a mini four and possibly a small child? <laughs> Make sure he's in a seat. Do you know what I mean? Uh, there's a lesbian, a bisexual, homosexual in a bar. They had a great night. Um, uh, oh, what another one? Uh, this is one of my favourites. There's a black fella, a black fella, another black fella, a black fella, a black fella, two more black fellas, a black fella, and a black fella. There's a brass section for Earth, Wind and Fire. Now. <laughs> so. Just lovely, harmless jokes that don't offend anybody. But what I do like doing, though, is I don't completely buy into. I just want to go, my mother in law, I'm not saying she's ugly. I'm not saying she's ugly. I can't. She's seriously disfigured in a fire. And people come up to me after gigs and go, you know that mother in law joke about the fire? He went, that's not PC. And I go, I don't care. It's I funny. really don't care. Just to, just still have that little bit of a dick, you know what I mean? So, yeah, Bernard was the host of the Perrier show in 92, and that was what kind of got him in the light, in the limelight. And, uh, but I still do him occasionally, you know, I do him, I pull him out, I pull, it depends on what, what, what weight I'm packing, sometimes I have to put a pillow in, and other times I just go au naturel. Uh, but I've still got the velveteen suit, still got the original Bernard, I don't think I've ever dry cleaning it. Oh, well, honestly. Don't shout fire in that. I've still got it, yeah. But I still do them occasionally. I mean, I, 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 the only problem with Bernard is it's a very, very, it's one joke, really, because it, it's set it up, pay it off with something PC. So it's called, they're called, in the technical world of comedy, it, it, they're called non jokes. It's, it, it's like a non joke, so it doesn't really, you know. Because I, I used to go down the territory, not necessarily, you know, race thing or sexual politics. or So I used to do daft ones like, uh, let me think, uh, like kids' jokes. Um, like I went to the butcher shop the other day and I said, uh, Have you got any bacon? And he said, Lean back. And I said, No, smoke middle, that's what's on me shopping with. <laughs> Just joke jokes, you don't like not PC ones, like my dog's called Isaiah. Well, why is your dog called Isaiah? Oh, and name all my pets after biblical characters. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You have to know the original, because do you know the original of that? One Isaiah than the other. But men, being men, love lists. Like, you know, they know like football results and who played and, you know what I mean, or records, you know, oh yeah, I, he was the guitarist or like women. Don't bother themselves with such trivialities. That's why we don't remember jokes. It's, that's why we're different. We're wired differently, right? Not many women are interested in memorising jokes about anything, really. So what I found with Bernard is I'll tell the joke and I'll, I've started trouble between couples. <laughs> and they're going to come on, happy as Larry, all locked up, and they're going to bite him at the end of the night because I'll go like, uh, and why did chicken cross the road? Well, it was a chicken, you see, so it's been, from a chicken's perspective, it has a small brain. You know, it could have been a farmyard, uh, or, uh, you know, I'm going to the science of it. And then, then you see the girl go, why is that funny? Why is it funny? And it, the, guy, the, the boyfriend go, well, it's the, the, the joke is, why did the chicken cross the, the other side? And then they go, I missed the next one now, you idiot! <laughs> So the bloke would explain to the girlfriend what the joke was supposed to be, then he'd miss the next one, then he'd start, don't you tell me to shut up. Oh, I've seen it in so many gigs where I've really, really caused havoc between a couple. I've had that sat with in, in the cinema. What's going on then? What's going on? What are you just going on? Just watch. Oh, okay. well, we I love what I love. You know, I love, I love like, really, like, films that are really, a, a lot, you know, keep really... Like a Die Hard, oh Die Hard, right? It's a great film when it came. It broke the mold when it came out. But if my mum 
She said, we should have got the pictures to see it. But if my mum would have watched that, I'd say at Christmas it's on. She'd sat down and not spoken through it, which is unlikely, but she'd have watched it. And I'd go, Mum, what did you think of that film? She'd go, oh, I'm worn out. <laughs> Avengers Assemble. Oh, it kills <laughs> Oh, I'm worn out. You got it sat there, it looks. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going to take my jacket off. Right, well, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have a little bit of an interval and then we're going to come back. John's going to have a wee and I'm going to have a wee and we're going to drink some more soda and wine. You girls are going to get yourselves a drink. Then we're going to have a a little bit of, we're going to have a competition. Do you know what I mean, a magic trick that you can do with chocolate bars? It's nothing rude, they don't want you in nasty. You don't have to worry about that. Ah, oh, that's great. Right? But we'll show you what it is. Yeah, I've, yeah. Been, I've left them upstairs in the fridge, so they're optimum temperature yeah. for what we do. Uh, so we're going to do that. Then we've got a surprise, we've been playing his favourite instrument. That's not nasty, either. Uh, it's all family friendly, above the voice. So uh, we're going to have a break. Get yourselves a drink from either that bar or that bar. And uh, can I have a round of applause? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 15 minutes, those are always 15 minutes. I'll join you in the green room, darling. We'll be talking about existential jazz. <laughs> name's Barry. Right. Those are boys there. If you're all ready, take a little bit of drinks. Can I ask you one favour? Shut the fuck up. That's it. In the nicest possible way, I've got Tourette's. By the way, uh, next time we'll get bar stools. You can sit, get yourselves up at the back, don't be shy. You can see further. Uh, okay. So um, we're going to get this second bit done, which is a Q&A type of thing, and then we're going to have a little bit of a, a few bits of tricks and things. Uh, and then John, normally we're going to go back and take photographs, but he can't, he's got to get back because he's a dutiful parent and get his, uh, his children to school in the morning. So we'll do that another time. So uh, he's not being snotty or snoozy or start showbiz. Family. Family, uh, family responsibilities, I think is the word. So, uh, I've got a drink and everything, I didn't even have to ask. Proper problem, isn't it? So, if you could uh, stop chatting in the bar, girls. Pointless, she's Italian, she's not going to listen. Oh, he's back! Ladies and gentlemen, this is John Thompson! Oh, I'm so bringing on because you've seen me. I know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here again. I've got to build my fuck up. Come on. Anyway, I've been asked a lot about Cheeky Monkey. Ah. You do Cheeky Monkey. Okay. Uh, Cheeky Monkey is probably one of the funniest things I've ever done uh, because a little bit of background on Cheeky Monkey was originally, and you probably this is a bit of a, like a you wouldn't know this when we were developing the idea for Alan Partridge. We wanted to bring me on as a sort of a failed vent act, uh, vent, meaning ventriloquism. Uh, and the idea originally was it was like Bob Carroll G's and it was going to be sick the dog. It was a dog that puked <laughs> on Alan. And it, it was like, ah, oh, please stop it. it. Right. And it was a bit kind of uh, one, you know, one note, just being, you know, a dog that was sick. So it, we kind of worked on it and we would. We, we, has, has everybody seen it? Has everyone seen it? Yeah, you cheeky, <laughs> oh, you cheeky, cheeky monkey. So Joe Beasley, he, the, 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 the thing is, it's all in the setup. Because Alan goes, oh, years ago at the host season's holiday, I saw this man and he, he, I literally <laughs> laughed like a drake. And he, he gives him the biggest build-up, massive build-up. He works, the funniest man I've ever seen. And he said, I said, if I got my own show, I said, I'll put you on it. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on to your sides. They might just split <laughs> Joe Beasley. Anyway, come on. With a monkey, I've still got it. I've still got the original monkey at my house. Oh, wait, I found him in the divorce movie, so I was like, there was some good in it. And uh, I found him. And uh, I'm absolutely terrible, uh, but the joy of it was this. So, so as someone who was, I've been doing stand up since 89, uh, uh, roughly 89, and then I retired for a bit, and then I still do a bit now and again. Uh, needs must. And for somebody who's done a lot, who'd really cut his teeth as a proper stand-up comedian, the, the, the job is not to die. The job is to do your best and, and, and have the audience on your side, fully engaged, laughing with you. Now, for this job, I had to do the opposite, which was joyous, because 
I had to go against my instincts and be as shit and as bad as I possibly could. Now the beauty of it was I had a wig on, I wasn't particularly well known, I think I might have just started men behaving badly at the time, so I wasn't a name. So for those people that have not seen Alan Partridge before, to, to be honest there were quite a few when Alan Partridge first came out, thought Alan Partridge was real. And people's parents would go, Alan Partridge, I can't watch him, he's so rude to the guests. <laughs> terrible. I don't know why he's got a job, he's vile. A vile man, he's terrible. So I went on, and I could see the audience just going, like, first of all, I went, hey, you, you cheeky monkey and all that. And I could see the audience literally go like that, and I go, and I think the joke is, what do you call a Swedish, uh, what does a Swedish Fred Flintstone say? And I go, uh, yabba dabba doo! And I go, oh no, that's wrong. <laughs> and I think I get it wrong. And I, it's supposed to be abba dabba doo, because it's good for that, so that's the joke. So, but I don't get it right, I say what he really says. So I go, yabba dabba doo! And I see the other, and I go, no, it's not that. <laughs> and then I saw the audience go, and I left, it, I left enough si silence just to feel it. <laughs> do you know, feel it? To love the pain, to relish the pain, I would normally wouldn't want. And then I could see people go like this in the audience. <laughs> I've seen a few of them tonight. Well, I'm going. Go. That's all it is. <laughs> So we got, I just got worse, I got worse and worse and worse and I pulled the thing off the Velcro bit and I held it with my fingers and everything and, he, and, it, and, it, and, it, and Steve says, comes on and he stops me and I said, no, no, it's all right, I'm, I'm all right, I'll carry on. He goes, no, 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 I've got to stop you, I've got to stop you. And the hardest thing he says to me, because it was very easy for me to say, I'm sorry, you're shit, you know what I mean? <laughs> what, is, what is words, the choice of words, he went, Listen, I can assure you, your act is really poor. <laughs> oh. It's horrible, isn't it? Horrible. Your act is really poor. You go on, just go, go away, go, go with some dignity and all that, and I just walk up and I bang the monkey in the corner. And it's a joy to be home, to watch. I love to watch it, and I don't really watch my back catalogue. If something I've filmed, if I've filmed something, I will watch it once either at the screening or live. Like, hopefully I'll try and watch it when it's like going out, you know. If I'm free on a Monday night, I'll watch it live when everyone else is watching it. But that's it. I don't go back and go like, some actors love to swim in the sea that is them. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> oh yes, I was watching some of my old films at the weekend. I was like, oh fuck, really? Really? So I just kind of watch it once and, uh, and my mum and dad are really sweet, they're my archivists. So if there's anything you want to see of mine in like 1980 something, I should have got it on VHS. Do you find a player? Do you know what I mean? So we need to get it all kind of converted to, D to DVD or even into a hard drive now. But Pink Chinky Bunky was the funniest thing, uh, one of the funniest things I've ever done. But it's very strange for me to watch it and laugh because I question myself, do, should I be laughing at my own? Should it be, is it right for me to laugh at my own thing? Is that right? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. It's all right. Absolutely. Right, on that, you did a documentary about stand-up. I don't know if you guys have seen it, John produced the documentary. And I've seen it, it was absolutely fantastic. How was that? Is there anything else coming about? I mean, uh, some that's of the It's a big, big number, that. And my mum is exec on that. I came up with the idea um, about stand-up being an art form, really. And it's kind of not... It is. It is an art form. It's like dance, it's like theatre, it's like music, it's like anything. It's, a, it's, it's an art, it's an expression of, of someone's art. And we wanted to do brass tacks, warts and all interviews with top of the game comics. And my, the, I sat, I, was, I, I didn't go to any of the interviews, I sat back and I kind of, I, I, I put the money up at first. And the film's called Dying Laughing. And we've got a roster on that that you wouldn't believe. Unbelievable people. We even got Jerry Lewis on that before he died. I mean, people were like that. Ah, Jerry Lewis is still alive. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's um, very stylistically done. My, my directors, uh, Lloyd Stanton and Paul Tugel, I met in London at the Drought Show Club. And there were heady days of showbiz parties and everything. But there was some good came out of it. And we, I met some great friends, very creative minds. And that's how this, this film came about Paul's previous film to that was The Art of Rap, From Nothing to Something with Ice-T, which is a brilliant film, he did that film. 
So Paul's a really good documentary maker, and Paul made that film what it is. Was it Seinfeld that got it? Yeah, we got we got Seinfeld in on it. Uh, um, so yeah, and there's the, the next thing is Dynamic TV. That's he's coming to TV because we got an, over an hour of each comic footage just talking about doing stand up. Fantastic. Yeah. It's, it's an HD it? black and white. If you can't look for it, it's called Dying Laughing. I'm the exact producer of it. But uh, it was my first foray into behind the cameras thing. But I, really, I won't take that much credit because <coughs> Lloyd and Paul, they did the groundwork. They went all over America interviewing these incredible people. I would love to have met some of these people, but they did such a brilliant job in it. But it was my idea and they had the confidence to trust in what, what I said. I'm right in thinking Billy Collie was, isn't it? Billy, isn't it? Yeah. Which is yeah, 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 yeah he's all right. He's he's, he's okay. Isn't he? He's he's poorly now, but he's got Alzheimer's, yeah. Parkinson's, and uh, well, he's got he's a cancer survivor as well, so he's quite poorly. But uh, yeah, he's, he's very funny in the film. Pound for pound, my favourite comedian ever, Billy Collins. Really? Yeah. Who's yours? Tommy Cooper, probably. Oh, really? Eric Morkham, Mama Parr, probably. I actually uh, Eric Morkham, Tommy Cooper, those two. Probably. I got my job at the comedy store because actually I, I named the right comedian that writes signs for this. The guy that owns the comedy store is his Don parents Ward. called Don Ward. Very, very much like Matt, the chap that owns this place. In fact, incredibly like the chap right. that owns this place. I work for has given me this fabulous opportunity. Uh, he's just left actually. Um, but. I was sat in an interview and I turned around to him and he looked at me and said, OK, Sam, and this is a guy that used to own strip clubs in London, the kind of place where you walk through the door, to knock your drink over and you had to buy a £300 young northern bloke to go down for the weekend, go into a strip club and the girl will be making them drink all night and knocking the champagne on the floor. He owned those kind of clubs. And the first thing we sat when I met him when he saw the comedy store and we had this interview and he just turned around to me and went, so uh, tell me, Sam, who's your favourite comedian? And I'm like, ah, oh, no, this isn't. This is the crunch question you could just see in his eyes. And I was there, um, you are old. Any comedian, let's stand up. And I just went, Les Dawson. That's that's the correct question. That's the correct answer. You got the job. Oh, that's, Oof, that was it. It brilliant. was the Les Dub. Fabulous. All the famous thing that you've done, great stuff that you've done was Coronation Street. What was that like? Yeah, um, it was all right. I, they didn't really use me, to be honest. I, I was. It wasn't great. They gave you a wet character, didn't they? It, was a wet, it wasn't used very well. Right, there's an old showbiz adage that goes, never work with children and animals. I was a children's entertainer with a talking parrot. <laughs> called Jesse Chadwick. He was also a spark, and I thought, well, that's how they're going to finish me off. I'm going to go up and above and breathe blue smoke, you know what I mean? <laughs> You know what I mean? But I was with Eileen, so he knew you were going to die or disappear if you were with Eileen. Oh, you are a black widow. I said, it's number 11 Coronation Street. There's all the death masks of all the previous people. So, yeah, you know what's going to last. The, no one's going to lift. If you get fucked with Eileen, you know your numbers will be eventually one way or another. We've got our own Eileen. Who got a death seat tonight? A black widow. It was okay. It was okay. It was. Originally, it wasn't the idea that I, I came in, my best, one of my best mates is Peter Bollard, Chris Gascoigne is one of my best friends, and the idea was I was his Navy buddy. What happened was Jane Danson, who plays, uh, oh, what's her name? Uh, Leanne, thank you. Leanne went away to have a baby and was on maternity leave and came back and didn't want maternity leave. She wanted to come back to work. And they don't like writing for single characters, so they didn't, didn't know what to do with Peter. So my storyline was, I, my mum threw me out, I, I knew Peter from the Navy, I moved in with Peter, I was a children's entertainer, which was great for his son, Alex, yeah, so I was great for his son, Alex, and I was, uh, bought, I was a big drinker, and he wasn't, and so it was a case of two men and a baby, and the odd couple, and it was great, we were mates, and I was all excited, and then they went, and then Jane came back, and they went, that's gone, that storyline, and I went, but hang on, that's what I signed up for, and they went, well that's so for you. Seriously, but yeah, so I I, ended up, I was kind of so, so, I, I didn't really, I didn't really do the story. I think I had one scene with Chris, the one, in the whole ten months. I was only in it ten months. And the but, it's iconic, and I don't, I, I don't, I enjoyed it when I, you know, you know, but I just felt like they could have done a bit more with me while they had me. You were on the old streets as well, like the proper one at the old Granada Studios. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, just a so it's a third scale, it's not quite, the new one's a full size, but it was a bit smaller. 
I prefer the old set. The old set. Was there any more visit that when it was the tour? Yeah, yeah. 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 Never have done that. They would have bought it off you now. I don't know. Stupid, yeah, because it's, it's, it. yeah, it's a London company, basically. I like London bunch of bricks. Excuse my French. Anyway, so, um, apart from Coronation Street, knowing you as I do, I know that you're a bit of a, you're a, bit of a foodie, aren't you? Massive, like massive. Food. You once came in and my, I had another pub in the Northern Quarter and he guessed every single element of the chef used to make his own sticky toffee puddings. And I gave him one and he sat there element by element telling me what was in the sticky toffee down. pudding. And his uh, chef was proper pissed off. Stick it. <laughs> proper pissed off. That recipe's not a secret anymore. Is it? <laughs> so, they were good sticky toffee puddings. So um, you've also appeared, did, was it Hans Kitchen with Gordon Ramsay? Was that what you did? I did the F word with Gordon. That was it. I got quite a funny with F, uh, Gordon. He's a good laugh, actually. I did another thing, which was great fun, where the problem with Gordon is he's not exactly a blank canvas you can print upon. So you could, he's very craggy, isn't he? And uh, what he did, he's disguised himself as a Scottish school teacher. Did you see it? And we went around cookery schools, and he was sussing out whose cookery school was the best. I was the front for it. I was kind of the, uh, what's the word, subterfuge for what he was getting up to. So I was like the presenter of this show going, hi, welcome to cookery schools. And uh, so we went to Norwich City to uh, Delia's place, but it was massive, full of old ladies. And Gordon got away, so he did the Scottish right? So, but he had like a ball cap on and glasses. And he was supposed to be like a retired school teacher from uh, East Kilbride or something like that, you know. Anyway, cause it, it was like, it was, he was hiding in plain sight with Delia because there were loads of people he could, you know, and no one sourced it was Gordon in, in makeup. And it was really, it was, a, it was a stitch up really. But then we went to see Jean-Christophe Novelli and uh, he was there and he knows Gordon very well. And it was a very small, you know, private cookery school. So it was like eight people there. We got there and he went, what is going on here? He goes, I know those eyes. <laughs> I was just realised he was fucking going to rise you. Oh my god. At least six hours in makeup. You know what I mean? Oh, literally packed up and gone. We couldn't do it. That was it. Game over. He sussed. sussed. That, yeah, they had to show it. Didn't he they? sussed it, yeah. I don't think I've seen that. Has anyone seen that? Seen that? No, no it's good fun, though. Was it? Yeah, I love uh, Well, because I don't drink and don't do drugs anymore. It's all about the food, so I try and go to like posh, you know, Michelin star restaurant. What's restaurant. your favourite restaurant in Manchester at the moment? Because I, I went out and had some food a while ago at what's supposed to be a top end restaurant. The, pro Shite. the problem we have in Manchester is it's England's second city, and we have Michelin star chefs, but we don't have a single Michelin star restaurant, which is a disgrace. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's not right, yeah. it's not right. Aidan Burnett is a very good club at Manchester. I went to the island, right? I had right. oven chips basically given to me. Well, the truffle. You've got to remember, the thing is, it's a beautiful place. place. It's a wonderful place. But the Ivy, it originally, is is a standalone restaurant in London, which is a, it's a, it's right in the middle of the theatre line. And it's like impossible to get into unless you're a famous or you've booked like eight months in advance. So that's where the Ivy came from. And what the Ivy menu is, for those of you who've never been, is it's traditional food cooked at the absolute apex. At the like it? Like chef as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the I had was lovely. Lovely. Absolutely lovely. That was poor grub, what you do. Yeah. So what they do is that, but what they... The thing is though, because they've, what they've used is the, the Ivy name, people think it's the Ivy, it's not. The Ivy restaurant is a completely separate entity in London that is standalone, right? You, when you go into the Ivy in Spinningfields, you're not going to the Ivy, you go to the Ivy Brasserie, which is a chain that has been rolled out to make money. They're all over the place, Leeds, Bristol, Clifton in Bristol, they're everywhere. There's about four in London, so what you've got, it's a spin-off of the, it's the Ivy group only, you know, but it's not the Ivy. So people think, oh, we're going to the Ivy. Ooh, restaurant gone. Put me that piece in. Uh, you know, you know. It's very nice, it's very nice to be wrong. Can't get in. It was a very nice. Can't get in for love the money. I've never been in one in love the money. No, what is What is this blue roof? What, burnt down? One in Manchester. <laughs> I think they must know I was coming. So talking about that, I, I know about the time, we're getting close to uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, you've also a talent, I believe. Well, yeah, it's been flagged up on Sunday brunch 
Now, it was Robert Bathurst came with it. I am slightly obsessed with British confectionery, uh, new and old. Like, I can tell you that the double decker in 1989 uh, removed the raisin. Oh. That's what the difference. That's what the difference. The raisin is no more. Yeah, yeah, no more. Now, now, well, I was very, very worried that the only British uh, chocolate factory was sold to the Americans, and that's Cadbury, and it was sold to Kraft. And I was very, very worried what kind of damage would be done. And I think the legacy, there was a kind of a handover of the deal to Kraft from Cadbury family. I've got a lot of respect for chocolatiers because they're Quakers. And what the Quakers are, are anti-war, they don't drink. And if you ever go to York, what the York, what the family did, the Terry's family, you know, in York, is what they did, they got drunks off the street by giving them hot chocolate. Now, hot chocolate, when they brought hot chocolate over, was an exotic thing. It was, it was unbelievable. It was like, what? What? And what they did was they got people off drink and they gave them cold, hot chocolate and they got into the hot chocolate and when they, if they sobered up enough they got them a job in the chocolate factory. And it was just brilliant and that's the Quakers. Bourneville in, in Birmingham, no pubs. You're not allowed to sell alcohol and what it is, it's full of lovely tailored parks, you know? Manicured little gardens and that. Because in the old days, people would go for like walks, you know, constitutionals they call them. So if you go to the area, that area of Birmingham, it's a strict law from the Cadbury dynasty that you cannot serve alcohol or anything. So basically, they were trying to beat drunks with chocolate, and they did it quite successfully. They also basically invented the National Health Service and whatever because of the doctors. And this amazing company. If you look into the history of the chocolate factories in this country, amazing. amazing. But I digress. So we now have a challenge. Well, the challenge is that I can feel any British chocolate. Well, any chocolate. We've got Americans as well, to it. I he can place any chocolate bar in my hands behind my back without looking, no cheating, and I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> we're up for this challenge. Right, what, what you've got to do to play along though is don't tell me what the chocolate bar Please is. Don't. All right? It will spoil it. It'll ruin, ruin the whole ethic of the gag, so here we go. I didn't buy the chocolate in Prime Rock. Robert, Robert Bathurst came on. Right, do uh, do it. Do you know what I'm going to place the first chocolate bar in your hands uh, using the art of chocolate passing? Uh, please, could you start? It's a star bar. It's a single one. Oh, look at those hands. Double decker. Double decker. No, no. You only get two tries. Come on, keep going, kid. It was once called something else. It was an Aztec bar. All right. Yes, Snickers, thank you, the Alvin. Right, you got that one, bit of a hefty clue. One more, well, we've got three more, actually. Ooh, one of my favourites. Oh, my God, all tangled up, there we go. Uh, have a go. Oh, very similar. To be fair, the rappers nowadays are basically identical, only for all chocolate bars. He was good at this in the 80s. <laughs> Come on. Mars. Yeah. Yay. I, I, I've got your magic now. I see your magic. A Mars a day makes you fat. Hey! <laughs> is that one more? Jesus Christ, is that what it is? Right, one more. How can you rest? One more. Work, rest, and play. How does it you rest? Bouncing up your body, never sugar. What the hell is that? Full glucose. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One more. There we are. And then the last one. Go on, sausage. It's not sausage. Crunchy. Oh, hold on. I've learned the technique now. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Right, here we go. Here's the ringer. If you get this one, I'll kiss you. Oh. It's a ringer. This is ring. This is the foreign element. What help? No clues. No clues. Come on, little. It's the real thing, actually. Is it a Butterfinger? Ooh, it's, it's the same company. A Hershey? It's, it's not, not far off. Well, no, it's not. But it's, um, there's another one. There's Hershey's and there's another one. I'll give you that. Uh, Reese's? Yep, yeah. and Reese's. Horrible. <laughs> 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 
They're horrible, are they? <laughs> that one's actually all right. I've tasted it and stuck it back in the packet. <laughs> See, I'm not great on American. Uh, is it? Uh, it's not a butterfinger. It's no. It's not a cookies and cream. Uh, no. No, no God, I've got bats on that one. All right, well, still Reese's though, fruit and nut bar. Uh, because of that, you can have that one. Well, you know, I didn't know if there existed. Well, there we go. Considering that, that is a skill. Have a round of applause, please. Um, there is also another skill about John, as we mentioned his love of jazz, because he has a huge love of jazz. Um, could we have the drums please? You bring the drums over, please, girls and boys. We're going to get a live performance now of John's percussive talents. On our, I've, we haven't got the drum kit here, because obviously I'm not a drummer. I'm more of a, a singer. But seriously. So these are our drums, we've got some pans out of the kitchen. Here we go. They've been clean, look, this is our kitchen, spotless it is. Actually, that's the lid of the steam kettle, we haven't got a coffee machine yet. We're going to have one soon, and everything will be proper. That's going to be like a symbol. Okay. How's that? Shall we be last? Can we all be last, will we? Thank you, ladies. Uh, here we are. Look at that. What's that one, Dave? What's that drum? The snare, that. Oh. That's the snare. What's this one? Tom Tom? That, yeah, for the, the, the bass drum. Oh. Yeah, Tom. Oh. 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 Bass drum, that, maybe. Oh. Oh. Can, we go on? can we do this? Oh. We're a bit wet. Uh, the chef's been cooking with <laughs> Literally, the chef. I said the chef, finish cooking, wash all the pans, and he's to use them as drums. He thought it was fucking mental. <laughs> he's wanting you all. Is this, is this structured in any way that can work? She won't kill you, you know what I mean? How good was that? Another round of applause, please. <laughs> Have a round of applause to my chef for doing such a stirring job on the as well. You know our kitchen is five out of five stars. Water all over me, me working tackle. Um, so we're gonna have a little, little, a short Q and A, then I'm gonna give him a hug and we're gonna say good night. So, who's got Eileen, what's your question? I do appreciate there are, I'm trying to shout as loud as I can to everybody in here. There's never one with one sentence. Enunciate, Eileen, enunciate. I do appreciate there are various different types of comedy. Yeah. Um, you're in Britain, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Diane Offit, she was, she was interviewed for that. Fantastic. Oh, oh, yeah. If you uh, haven't if you have visited the Victoria Ferry Museum, it's got the exhibition still on. Fantastic, I know all of that. Right, next question. Yes. I did. did yeah, I did. It was a nightmare. Yeah, I did. I got picked up first in the first round. Yeah, it's a long story, but you, it is. It was heartbreaking for me, genuinely. And they sabotaged you deliberately on that show. It was a nasty. Yeah, 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 yeah. It took me an hour to tell. I can't do it now. I have to have me back. I'll do a whole hour about it. Yeah. It, 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 it was hellish. It was hellish, that experience. Really, really hard. Uh, I love cooking. I'm a very competent cook. And it was one of the only reality shows I wanted to do because it was something I was very, very passionate about. I'm very competent at. And then to be booted off in the first round, it just broke me. I didn't pick up a pound for four months. Seriously, because... Well, the great thing is, though, when I got divorced, I signed up for Hello Fresh, right? And it's just the same thing. It really... I love it because it's for two, but... It's all right, because I, I have plenty of dates. It's a great way to get dates, you know what I mean? So, um, I said, do you do it for one when I just first moved into my own house? And they went, no. And I went, oh, I don't need to say it like that. No. Uh, so, yeah, that, the great thing about that is, it's kind of, I'm not selling it, by the way, but it was just like, it, 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 they deliver the ingredients and the, and the meat and the spices to you, and you cook things that you wouldn't normally cook. And I, I hate waste that we brought up you know, I've kind of brought up, you know, I can't bear, I think it's a annoying thing. I can't bear away, so everything gets cooked. So, so that saved me, like, that kind of saved my post MasterChef depression because it was a horrible, horrible experience. I, I, it really killed me. I cut my finger really badly in it as well. Uh, and, I, I, and, and I had to do stuff that was very hard compared to the rest. It kind of threw me in at the deep end and. I've never trusted Greg Wallace anyway. So well, yeah. the thing is, though, ha Eyes too close one, to you're not a chef when you come out. You're a, a you're a very competent cook, aren't you? It's master cook. You're not a chef. You're not a chef. You're a master cook. You're a cook when you come out. And the other thing is, Greg Wise is a grocer. Right? He's a fruit and veg man. And in Johnson Road, every restaurant he's opened is closed. <laughs> so fuck him. Anyway, madam, you've got a question. Um, um, have you worked with the RSCA? The RSC? Yeah. The Royal Shakespeare Company? No, I've not worked with the RSC, oh, but I would, li I would like to. Yeah, I was going to ask you to do some Shakespearean prose. Some Shakespearean prose? Bit of puck. I don't really know any off by heart. I'm not a proper thespian. <laughs> it's a tough one, that's To be good. or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is noble to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous oh. uh, I'm a bit moist. Anyway, um, I'd love to do Shakespeare, but the right one. The right one. They're always asking me to play bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream, but I think it's a little bit kind of narrow minded. I think I, I could do other things. Right, I think we're going to be and I do a pretty We're going to get one more question from this lady here. Yes. We well, have a round of applause for Pete! And I want to say, mate, the stuff that you did as a man who has suffered with uh, little bits of moments of darkness now and again, the black dog as they call it, the performance you gave uh, in the depression and the breakdown that that character had uh, resonated with me incredibly at the time. So I personally want to thank you for that because it was one hell of a performance. You were brilliant. As an actor, I had to portray the truth. Like I said before, I have to be as realistic as possible. Cold feet's very real, and we tackle very real issues. We do, we've done depression, we're doing breast cancer at the moment. We do debris, we, we try and cover real things. So as a duty, we have a care, duty of care as a cast to inject as much reality into that, you know, as we possibly can. When I did that story of depression, it was Mike Bullen's story. It was the writer's story. He got terribly depressed, he got writer's block, and then got very, very down. So I, as a, I had a duty of care to portray that as a, you know, it was the writer's story to do it the best I could. And I, 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 I got, uh, 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 I got a lot of, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, Brilliant. Yeah, I, I, yeah, thank you Brilliant. for that portrayal. Uh, of course, I've had my own demons, so you kind of call upon those, you know, and life's not runs and runs smoothly. I've had a few things happen in my life that. Uh, a bit very difficult, but you know, 
that's life. You know, you've got to live on life's terms. But as an actor, it's great that I've had a life. I've had a, I've had a, a very exciting life. I've had, a, I've had a life, you know what I mean? And the more exciting and up and down a life you can have, what better for an actor? Because you can call on all those things that you've been through. If I had a boring life, I'd be a shit actor. Do you know what I mean? I've had experiences I can call upon to use to portray that reality, to portray that truth. And the, the, the and it was a double-edged sword because when I played that depression storyline, it, the awareness it created, because there was no social media when we started Cold Feet, it was word of mouth. People go, oh, I love you in that show, great, thanks, John. Yeah. Yeah. But now, it's instant. It's an instant response, instant, instant review, instant critique. And it's uh, the, the, men, the awareness I created for mental health for men, because they're all too shy. Well, lots of people's dads here will know. You'll know your dad, he doesn't want to go to the doctor. When it's, you know, when, and, yeah. Let alone depression, because it's embarrassing for them, it makes them a weak. But I think things have opened. Things have, there's a lot of good things happening in society, particularly in that bill where we are opening up and we are being honest, and we have to be because we need to survive. Do you know what I mean? And I can personally say, and this is you know, I, I had a tough time. And John actually inboxed me through social media and wrote me a really nice message and was very supportive. So I want to give you a round of applause for that person. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one last question, which is going to come from you, there, Ziggy. Brilliant. Brilliant. Idea. Brilliant. Hope you're going to have loads yeah. more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Writing, directing, producing, acting. What would be your dream, dream, dream job next? My dream job, I've always said this, is as, ever since I was a little boy, I, uh, my favourite films were James Bond. Um, <laughs> not play James. Clearly I'm not I'm not right for that. But a baddie. Um, I would love to play a Bond villain, really. But the problem is though, it's kind of so serious. I know exactly because I've studied I, I, I mean I, I, I absolutely adore but I did Bond on my mastermind. Uh, I did Bond villains and I got 14 and no passes. I did alright. I missed it by a point. I, I, it was my chosen specialised subject. I'm, I, one point, Stuart Lee beat me by a point on the whole thing. He, he killed me. I, I, he got 27, I got 26. But it doesn't matter. He's got as painful as Master Chef, I'm going to show you that. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to be a Bond villain. I absolutely adore the idea of, of doing that. I love playing baddies because it's quite easy. My go to casting is kind of vulnerable, kind of uh, uh, people who. You know, well, just vulnerable. Pete's very vulnerable. You know what I mean. The thing about Pete is, I it, there's not. It, it, I I like to inhabit characters, so it'd be nice to do a biopic. I'd love to play someone like I am talking. To, I'm talking about playing Oliver Reed in his latter years. And that's that's something I want to write. Oh yes, yeah. that's something I'd like to play. Because Big lads said, oh, for many years, you do look like him. You, you, you do, you look like Ollie, you know. And I used to behave like Ollie, which is great. So it's a double, it's great because I'm a sober person playing an alcoholic, you know what I mean? So it, 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 that'd be really exciting for me. But I think the idea of being able to get into a role where you've got, like I played Winston Churchill just for a bit, but it was just brilliant to kind of, you know, look in the mirror and pull the faces and, you know, try the voice and everything. That's a real challenge for actors. Those jobs, people go, Tom Hardy is an amazing actor. He is, but it's the parts. It's the roles. Give me those roles, and I'm really fucking doing justice. Trust me. <laughs> Boom! Oh, hey, there's a role. Before I go, I'm going to do a magic trick for you. Oh, yeah, you're going to do a magic trick. Okay. Before you, when you get that ready, this lady here is a fellow publican, part of Thwaites family, as I am now. And what's your name again? Debbie. Debbie's birthday next week. It is. Right, can you say happy birthday, if you don't mind? Ladies and gentlemen, after one. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Debbie. Happy birthday to you. Right, I'm going to do it. Marvellous. And John. Here's the boys. John. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Nicholas. Happy birthday, Nicholas. That was for you as well. All right, how's that? That's for you. Happy birthday to you, everybody! Happy birthday to you! 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 Happy birthday
<laughs> okay, but mate, I'm doing my birthday. This is my big finish, so oh, I, I love magic, and I always have since I was a little boy. I'm so going to guys, this chat, let's get, get Blackpool, this one. Blackpool, Blackpool, Blackpool Magic Convention next week, oh, which is quite interesting. I just hope some of them have been please checked. Um, okay, there's six, six cards here. Okay, six cards. Absolutely normal. If you just check them, John. Can you just check, check. Six cards. We've never met before. These are my. This is my. This is my James Bond card routine, ladies and gentlemen. They are. Well, absolutely cards. normal. Okay, so do you want to shuffle them for me? I think you just. Just did. Do you want to do them again? That's. You just well, that's all right. Don't worry. Just mix them up a bit. Can you hold the microphone for me? Okay, I'm going to place the cards on the table. Yeah. Right. The six cards on the table there. John, I want you to pick a number. Pick a number between one and six. Don't pick the middle! Shh. <laughs> I'm not picking a number, something else. Right, um, any number between one and six. Five. You sure? Right, check this. Kind of. Five, definitely five. Five, my favourite band. Five, are you ready? Using the James Bond pen, are you ready? James Bond. We count. Din, 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 F. Din, 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 din. I. Din, 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 din. V. E. Right? So, got that? Yeah. Ready? I'm shitting me snaps, isn't it? F-I-V-E, right? You definitely F want five. I -V -E. You can have anything from one to six. You can change it if you like. You can change it, you can change it. One to six. Three. Three, all right. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three. Just to prove that I'm not messing about. <laughs> one, two, three, okay? Yeah. Right, turn that card over. One, two, three. Turn it over. Thank you. Right. Take that now. What we'll do is I'll take a photograph of that with a with with strange bond pen. <laughs> Fabulous. There we go, took the picture, right? Okay. Is that really a James Bond pen? Yes. Give that a... <laughs> Give that pen a rub because it needs to develop. Are you ready? <laughs> this is not the wrong time. This is the same. Have you I've got, got that? Pay here, attention, Double S there, magic pen. So I'll photograph that card. Yep. Right, you could have picked any number, right? Between one and six. I'll any number, any right? Number. And I've just taken a photograph of that card with the James Bond pen. Hold that hold this microphone. I can't wait for this. Wait for it to wait for it to develop. Are you ready? To vent. And inside the photograph is. Oh. You wizard! Double seven. Please. Thank you, John, for that I'm keeping that shot. Thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, a massive round of applause for Mr. John Thompson! <laughs> if you want to see John doing an interview again, call him last for what the day to do. 23rd of February with Chris Gascoigne, we're doing a couple of two Yeah, John and Chris Gascoigne are talking about Cold Street, talking about Coronation Street, Charity Fundraiser, at Salford Lads Club on the... 23rd, I believe. 23rd. Oh, right, so girls and boys, unfortunately, John has got to get off, he's got to get his daughter up. You've been fabulous, I've been fabulous, but he's been amazing! It's the John Thompson! Stop. Don't, don't, don't stop. Don't, don't stop.